Blackstone Audiobooks presents The Door into Summer by Robert A. Heinlein For A.P. and Phyllis, Mick and Annette, Ilurophiles all. 1. One winter shortly before the Six Weeks' War, my tomcat Petronius the Arbiter and I lived in an old farmhouse in Connecticut. I doubt if it is there any longer, as it was near the edge of the blast area of the Manhattan near Miss, and those old frame buildings burn like tissue paper. Even if it is still standing, it would not be a desirable rental because of the fallout. But we liked it then, Pete and I. The lack of plumbing made the rent low, and what had been the dining room had a good north light for my drafting board. The drawback was that the place had eleven doors to the outside. Twelve, if you counted Pete's door. I always tried to arrange a door of his own for Pete. In this case, a board fitted into a window in an unused bedroom, and in which I had cut a cat strainer just wide enough for Pete's whiskers. I have spent too much of my life opening doors for cats. I once calculated that since the dawn of civilization, 978 man-centuries have been used up that way. I could show you the figures. Pete usually used his own door, except when he could bully me into opening a people door for him, which he preferred. But he would not use his door when there was snow on the ground. While still a kitten, all fluff and buzzes, Pete had worked out a simple philosophy. I was in charge of quarters, rations, and weather. He was in charge of everything else. But he held me especially responsible for the weather. Connecticut winters are good only for Christmas cards. Regularly, that winter, Pete would check his own door, refuse to go out it because of that unpleasant white stuff beyond it. He was no fool. Then badger me to open a people door. He had a fixed conviction that at least one of them must lead into summer weather. Each time this meant that I had to go around with him to each of eleven doors, hold it open while he satisfied himself that it was winter out that way too, then go on to the next door, while his criticisms of my mismanagement grew more bitter with each disappointment. Then he would stay indoors until hydraulic pressure utterly forced him outside. When he returned, the ice in his pads would sound like little clogs on the wooden floor, and he would glare at me and refuse to purr until he had chewed it all out, whereupon he would forgive me until the next time. But he never gave up his search for the door into summer. On 3 December 1970, I was looking for it, too. My quest was about as hopeless as Pete's had been in a Connecticut January. What little snow there was in Southern California was kept on mountains for skiers, not in downtown Los Angeles. The stuff probably couldn't have pushed through the smog anyway. But the winter weather was in my heart. I was not in bad health, aside from a cumulative hangover. I was still on the right side of thirty by a few days, and I was far from being broke. No police were looking for me, nor any husbands, nor any process servers. There was nothing wrong that a slight case of amnesia would not have cured. But there was winter in my heart, and I was looking for the door to summer. If I sound like a man with an acute case of self-pity, you are correct. There must have been well over two billion people on this planet in worse shape than I was. Nevertheless, I was looking for the door into summer. Most of the ones I had checked lately had been swinging doors, like the pair in front of me then, the Sans Souci Bar Grill, the sign said. I went in, picked a booth halfway back, placed the overnight bag I was carrying carefully on the seat, slid in by it, and waited for the waiter. The overnight bag said, I said, Take it easy, Pete. No! Nonsense! You just went. Pipe down, the waiter is coming. Pete shut up. I looked up as the waiter leaned over the table and said to him, A double shot of your bar scotch, a glass of plain water, and a split of ginger ale. The waiter looked upset. Ginger ale, sir, with scotch? Do you have it or don't you? 
Why, yes, of course, but... Then fetch it. I'm not going to drink it. I just want to sneer at it. And bring a saucer, too. As you say, sir. He polished the tabletop. How about a small steak, sir? Or the scallops are very good today. Look, mate, I'll tip you for the scallops if you'll promise not to serve them. All I need is what I ordered. And don't forget the saucer. He shut up and went away. I told Pete again to take it easy. The Marines had landed. The waiter returned, his pride appeased by carrying the split of ginger ale on the saucer. I had him open it while I mixed the scotch with the water. Would you like another glass for the ginger ale, sir? I'm a real buckaroo. I drink it out of the bottle. He shut up and let me pay him and tip him, not forgetting a tip for the scallops. When he had gone, I poured ginger ale into the saucer and tapped on the top of the overnight bag. Soup's on, Pete. It was unzipped. I never zipped it with him inside. He spread it with his paws, poked his head out, looked around quickly, then levitated his forequarters and placed his front feet on the edge of the table. I raised my glass and we looked at each other. Here's to the female race, Pete. Find them and forget them. He nodded. It matched his own philosophy perfectly. He bent his head daintily and started lapping up ginger ale. If you can, that is, I added and took a deep swig. Pete did not answer. Forgetting a female was no effort to him. He was the natural-born bachelor type. Facing me through the window of the bar was a sign that kept changing. First it would read, Work while you sleep. Then it would say, And dream your troubles away. Then it would flash in letters twice as big, Mutual Assurance Company. I read all three several times without thinking about them. I knew as much and as little about suspended animation as everybody else did. I had read a popular article or so when it was first announced, and two or three times a week I'd get an insurance company ad about it in the morning mail. I usually chucked them without looking at them since they didn't seem to apply to me any more than lipstick ads did. In the first place, until shortly before then, I could not have paid for cold sleep. It's expensive. In the second place, why should a man who was enjoying his work, was making money, expected to make more, was in love and about to be married, commit semi-suicide? If a man had an incurable disease and expected to die anyhow, but thought the doctors a generation later might be able to cure him, and he could afford to pay for suspended animation while medical science caught up with what was wrong with him, then cold sleep was a logical bet. Or if his ambition was to make a trip to Mars and he thought that clipping one generation out of his personal movie film would enable him to buy a ticket, I suppose that was logical, too. There had been a news story about a cafe society couple who got married and went right straight from City Hall to the sleep sanctuary of Western World Insurance Company with an announcement that they had left instructions not to be called until they could spend their honeymoon on an interplanetary liner. Although I had suspected that it was a publicity gag rigged by the insurance company and that they had ducked out the back door under assumed names. Spending your wedding night cold as a frozen mackerel does not have the ring of truth in it. And there was the usual straightforward financial appeal, the one the insurance companies bore down on. Work while you sleep. Just hold still and let whatever you have saved grow into a fortune. If you are 55 and your retirement fund pays you 200 a month, why not sleep away the years, wake up still 55, and have it pay you 1,000 a month? To say nothing of waking up in a bright new world, which would probably promise you a much longer and healthier old age in which to enjoy the 1,000 a month. That one they really went to town on each company proving with incontrovertible figures that its selection of stocks for its trust fund made more money faster than any of the others. Work while you sleep. It had never appealed to me. I wasn't 55, I didn't want to retire, and I hadn't seen anything wrong with 1970. Until recently, that is to say. Now I was retired whether I liked it or not. I didn't. Instead of being on my honeymoon, I was sitting in a second-rate bar drinking scotch purely for anesthesia, 
Instead of a wife, I had one much-scarred tomcat with a neurotic taste for ginger ale. And as for liking right now, I would have swapped it for a case of gin, then busted every bottle. But I wasn't broke. I reached into my coat and took out an envelope, opened it. It had two items in it. One was a certified check for more money than I had ever had before at one time. The other was a stock certificate in Hired Girl Incorporated. They were both getting a little must. I had been carrying them ever since they were handed to me. Why not? Why not duck out and sleep my troubles away? Pleasanter than joining the Foreign Legion, less messy than suicide, and it would divorce me completely from the events and the people who had made my life go sour. So why not? I wasn't terribly interested in the chance to get rich. Oh, I had read H. G. Wells's When the Sleeper Wakes, not only when the insurance companies started giving away free copies, but before that, when it was just another classic novel. I knew what compound interest and stock appreciation could do, but I was not sure that I had enough money both to buy the long sleep and to set up a trust large enough to be worthwhile. The other argument appealed to me more. Go Betty by and wake up in a different world. Maybe a lot better world the way the insurance companies would have you believe or maybe worse, but certainly different. I could make sure of one important difference. I could doze long enough to be certain that it was a world without Belle Darkin, or Miles Gentry, either, but Belle especially. If Belle was dead and buried, I could forget her, forget what she had done to me, cancel her out, instead of gnawing my heart with the knowledge that she was only a few miles away. Let's see. How long would that have to be? Bell was twenty-three, or claimed to be. I recalled that once she had seemed to let slip that she remembered Roosevelt as president. Well, in her twenties, anyhow. If I slept seventy years, she'd be an obituary. Make it seventy-five and be safe. Then I remembered the strides they were making in geriatrics. They were talking about a hundred and twenty years as an attainable, normal lifespan. Maybe I would have to sleep a hundred years. I wasn't certain that any insurance company offered that much. Then I had a gently fiendish idea, inspired by the warm glow of scotch. It wasn't necessary to sleep until Bell was dead. It was enough, more than enough, and just the fitting revenge on a female to be young when she was old. Just enough younger to rub her nose in it, say about thirty years. I felt a paw gentle as a snowflake on my arm. Roar! announced Pete. Greedy gut, I told him, and poured him another saucer of ginger ale. He thanked me with a polite wait, then started lapping it. But he had interrupted my pleasantly nasty chain of thought. What the devil could I do about Pete? You can't give away a cat the way you can a dog. They won't stand for it. Sometimes they go with the house, but not in Pete's case. To him, I had been the one stable thing in a changing world ever since he was taken from his mother nine years earlier. I had even managed to keep him near me in the army, and that takes real wangling. He was in good health and likely to stay that way even though he was held together with scar tissue. If he could just correct a tendency to lead with his right, he would be winning battles and siring kittens for another five years at least. I could pay to have him kept in the kennel until he died, unthinkable, or could have him chloroformed, equally unthinkable, or I could abandon him. That is what it boils down to with a cat. You either carry out the Chinese obligation you have assumed, or you abandon the poor thing, let it go wild, destroy its faith in the eternal rightness. The way Bell had destroyed mine. So, Danny boy, you might as well forget it. Your own life may have gone sour as dill pickles. That did not excuse you in the slightest from your obligation to carry out your contract to this super-spoiled cat. Just as I reached that philosophical truth, Pete sneezed. The bubbles had gone up his nose. Gesundheit, I answered, and quit trying to drink it so fast. Pete ignored me. His table manners averaged better than mine, and he knew it. 
Our waiter had been hanging around the cash register talking with the cashier. It was the after-lunch slump, and the only other customers were at the bar. The waiter looked up when I said gazoon tight and spoke to the cashier. They both looked our way. Then the cashier lifted the flap gate in the bar and headed toward us. I said quietly, MPs, Pete. He glanced around and ducked down into the bag. I pushed the top together. The cashier came over and leaned on my table, giving the seats on both sides of the booth a quick double O. Sorry, friend, he said flatly but you'll have to get that cat out of here. What cat? The one you were feeding out of that saucer. I don't see any cat. This time he bent down and looked under the table. You've got him in that bag, he accused. Bag? Cat? I said wonderingly. My friend, I think you've come down with an acute figure of speech. Huh? Don't give me any fancy language. You've got a cat in that bag. Open it up. Do you have a search warrant? What? Don't be silly. You're the one talking silly, demanding to see the inside of my bag without a search warrant. Fourth Amendment. And the war has been over for years. Now that we've settled that, please tell my waiter to make it the same all around. Or fetch it yourself. He looked pained. Brother, this isn't anything personal, but I've got a license to consider. No dogs, no cats. It says so right up there on the wall. We aim to run a sanitary establishment. Then your aim is poor. I picked up my glass. See the lipstick marks? You ought to be checking your dishwasher, not searching your customers. I don't see no lipstick. I wiped most of it off. But let's take it down to the Board of Health and get the bacteria count checked. He sighed. You got a badge? No. Then we're even. I don't search your bag, and you don't take me down to the Board of Health. Now, if you want another drink, step up to the bar and have it, on the house, but not here. He turned and headed up front. I shrugged. We were just leaving anyhow. As I started to pass the cashier's desk on my way out, he looked up. No hard feelings? Nope. But I was planning to bring my horse in here for a drink later. Now I won't. Suit yourself. The ordinance doesn't say a word about horses. But just one more thing. Does that cat really drink ginger ale? Fourth Amendment, remember? I don't want to see the animal. I just want to know. Well, I admitted, he prefers it with a dash of bitters, but he'll drink it straight if he has to. It'll ruin his kidneys. Look here a moment, friend. At what? Lean back so that your head is close to where mine is. Now look up at the ceiling over each booth, the mirrors up in the decorations. I knew there was a cat in there, because I saw it. I leaned back and looked. The ceiling of the joint had a lot of junky decoration, including many mirrors, I saw now that a number of them, camouflaged by the design, were so angled as to permit the cashier to use them as periscopes without leaving his station. We need that, he said apologetically. You'd be shocked at what goes on in those booths, if we didn't keep an eye on them. It's a sad world. Amen, brother. I went on out. Once outside, I opened the bag and carried it by one handle. Pete stuck his head out. You heard what the man said, Pete. It's a sad world. Worse than sad when two friends can't have a quiet drink together without being spied on. That settles it. Now? asked Pete. If you say so. If we're going to do it, there's no point in stalling. Now? Pete answered emphatically. Unanimous. It's right across the street. The receptionist at the Mutual Assurance Company was a fine example of the beauty of functional design. In spite of being streamlined for about Mach 4, she displayed frontal-mounted radar housings and everything else needed for her basic mission. I reminded myself that she would be Whistler's mother by the time I was out, and told her that I wanted to see a salesman. "'Please be seated. I will see if one of our client executives is free.' Before I could sit down, she added, our Mr. Powell will see you. This way, please. 
Our Mr. Powell occupied an office which made me think that Mutual did pretty well for itself. He shook hands moistly, sat me down, offered me a cigarette, and attempted to take my bag. I hung on to it. Now, sir, how can we serve you? I want the long sleep. His eyebrows went up and his manner became more respectful. No doubt Mutual would write you a camera floater for seven bucks, but the long sleep let them get their patty paws on all of a client's assets. A very wise decision, he said reverently. I wish I were free to take it myself, but family responsibilities, you know. He reached out and picked up a form. Sleep clients are usually in a hurry. Let me save you time and bother by filling this out for you and we'll arrange for your physical examination at once. Just a moment. Eh? One question. Are you set up to arrange cold sleep for a cat? He looked surprised, then pained. You're jesting. I opened the top of the bag. Pete stuck his head out. Meet my sidekick. Just answer the question, please. If the answer is no, I want a sachet up to Central Valley Liability. Their offices are in the same building, aren't they? This time he looked horrified. Mr. Ah, uh, uh, I didn't get your name. Dan Davis. Mr. Davis, once a man enters our doors, he is under the benevolent protection of mutual assurance. I couldn't let you go to Central Valley. How do you plan to stop me, Judo? Please. He glanced around and looked upset. Our company is an ethical company. Meaning that Central Valley is not? I didn't say that. You did. Mr. Davis, don't let me sway you. You won't. But get sample contracts from each company. Get a lawyer. Better yet, get a licensed semanticist. Find out what we offer and actually deliver and compare it with what Central Valley claims to offer. He glanced around again and leaned toward me. I shouldn't say this, and I hope you won't quote me, but they don't even use the standard actuarial tables. Maybe they give the customer a break instead. What? My dear Mr. Davis, we distribute every accrued benefit. Our charter requires it, while Central Valley is a stock company. Maybe I should buy some of their... Look, Mr. Powell, we're wasting time. Will Mutual accept my pal here, or not? If not, I've been here too long already. You mean you want to pay to have that creature preserved alive in hypothermia? I mean I want both of us to take the long sleep, and don't call him that creature. His name is Petronius. Sorry, I'll rephrase my question. You are prepared to pay two custodial fees to have both of you, you and uh, Petronius, committed to our sanctuary? Yes but not two standard fees. Something extra, of course, but you can stuff us both in the same coffin. You can't honestly charge as much for Pete as you charge for a man. This is most unusual. Of course it is, but we'll dicker over the price later, or I'll dicker with Central Valley. Right now I want to find out if you can do it. Ah, uh, he drummed on his desktop. Just a moment. He picked up his phone and said, Opal, get me Dr. Burquist. I didn't hear the rest of the conversation, for he switched on the privacy guard. But after a while, he put down the instrument and smiled as if a rich uncle had died. Good news, sir. I have overlooked momentarily the fact that the first successful experiments were made on cats. The techniques and critical factors for cats are fully established. In fact, there is a cat at the Naval Research Laboratory in Annapolis, which is and has been for more than twenty years alive in hypothermia. I thought NRL was wiped out when they got Washington. Just the surface buildings, sir, not the deep vaults, which is a tribute to the perfection of the technique. The animal was unattended save by automatic machinery for more than two years, yet it still lives unchanged, unaged. As you will live, sir, for whatever period you elect to entrust yourself to mutual. I thought he was going to cross himself. Okay, okay. Now let's get on with the dicker. There were four factors involved. 
First, how to pay for our care while we were hibernating. Second, how long I wanted us to sleep. Third, how I wanted my money invested while I was in the freezer. And last, what happened if I conked out and never woke up. I finally settled on the year 2000, a nice round number and only 30 years away. I was afraid that if I made it any longer I would be completely out of touch. The changes in the last 30 years, my own lifetime, had been enough to bug a man's eyes out. Two big wars and a dozen little ones, the downfall of communism, the great panic, the artificial satellites, the change to atomic power. Why, when I was a kid they didn't even have multimorphs. I might find 2000 A.D. pretty confusing, but if I didn't jump that far, Bell would not have time to work up a fancy set of wrinkles. When it came to how to invest my dough, I did not consider government bonds and other conservative investments. Our fiscal system has inflation built into it. I decided to hang on to my hired girl stock and put the cash into other common stocks, with a special eye to some trends I thought would grow. Automation was bound to get bigger. I picked a San Francisco fertilizer firm, too. It had been experimenting with yeasts and edible algae. There were more people every year, and steak wasn't going to get any cheaper. The balance of the money I told him to put into the company's managed trust fund. But the real choice lay in what to do if I died in hibernation. The company claimed that the odds were better than 7 out of 10 that I would live through 30 years of cold sleep and the company would take either end of the bet. The odds weren't reciprocal, and I didn't expect them to be. In any honest gambling, there is a breakage to the house. Only crooked gamblers claim to give the sucker the best of it, and insurance is legalized gambling. The oldest and most reputable insurance firm in the world, Lloyd's of London, makes no bones about it. Lloyd's associates will take either end of any bet, but don't expect better than track odds. Somebody has to pay for our Mr. Powell's tailor-made suits. I chose to have every cent go to the company trust fund in case I died, which made Mr. Powell want to kiss me, and made me wonder just how optimistic those seven out of ten odds were. But I stuck with it because it made me an heir, if I lived, of everyone else with the same option, if they died. Russian roulette with the survivors picking up the chips. And with the company, as usual raking in the house percentage. I picked every alternative for the highest possible return and no hedging if I guessed wrong. Mr. Powell loved me, the way a croupier loves a sucker who keeps playing the zero. By the time we had settled my estate, he was anxious to be reasonable about Pete. We settled for 15% of the human fee to pay for Pete's hibernation and drew up a separate contract for him. There remained consent of court and the physical examination. The physical I didn't worry about. I had a hunch that once I elected to have the company bet that I would die, they would accept me even in the last stages of the Black Death. But I thought that getting a judge to okay it might be lengthy. It had to be done because a client in cold sleep was legally in chancery, alive but helpless. I needn't have worried. Our Mr. Powell had quadruplicate originals made of nineteen different papers. I signed till I got finger cramps, and a messenger rushed away with them while I went to my physical examination. I never even saw the judge. The physical was the usual tiresome routine except for one thing. Toward the end, the examining physician looked me sternly in the eye and said, Son, how long have you been on this binge? Binge? binge. What makes you think that, doctor? I'm as sober as you are. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled. Knock it off and answer me. Hmm, I'd say about two weeks, a little over. Compulsive drinker? How many times have you pulled this stunt in the past? Well, as a matter of fact, I haven't. You see, I started to tell him what Bell and Miles had done to me, why I felt the way I did. He shoved a palm at me. Please, I've got troubles of my own, and I'm not a psychiatrist. Really, all I'm interested in is finding out whether or not your heart will stand up under the ordeal of putting you down to four degrees centigrade, which it will. And I ordinarily don't care why anyone is nutty enough to crawl into a hole and pull it in after him. 
I just figure it is one less damned fool underfoot. But some residual tinge of professional conscience prevents me from letting any man, no matter how sorry a specimen, climb into one of those coffins while his brain is sodden with alcohol. Turn around. Huh? Turn around. I'm going to inject you in your left buttock. I did, and he did. While I was rubbing it, he went on. Now drink this. In about twenty minutes you will be more sober than you've been in a month. Then, if you have any sense, which I doubt, you can review your position and decide whether to run away from your troubles or stand up to them like a man. I drank it. That's all. You can get dressed. I'm signing your papers, but I'm warning you that I can veto it right up to the last minute. No more alcohol for you at all. A light supper and no breakfast. Be here at noon tomorrow for final check. He turned away and didn't even say goodbye. I dressed and went out of there, sore as a boil. Powell had all my papers ready. When I picked them up, he said, You can leave them here if you wish, and pick them up at noon tomorrow. The set that goes into the vault with you, that is. What happens to the others? We keep one set ourselves. Then, after you are committed, we file one set with the court and one in the Carlsbad archives. Ah, uh, did the doctor caution you about diet? He certainly did. I glanced at the papers to cover my annoyance. Powell reached for them. I'll keep them safe overnight. I pulled them back. I can keep them safe. I might want to change some of these stock selections. Ah, uh, it's rather late for that, my dear Mr. Davis. Don't rush me. If I do make any changes, I'll come in early. I opened the overnight bag and stuck the papers down in a side flap beside Pete. I had kept valuable papers there before. While it might not be as safe as the public archives in the Carlsbad Caverns, they were safer than you might think. A sneak thief had tried to take something out of that flap on another occasion. He must still have the scars of Pete's teeth and claws. 2. My car was parked under Pershing Square where I had left it earlier in the day. I dropped money into the parking attendant, set the bug on Arterial West, got Pete out and put him on the seat, and relaxed. Or tried to relax. Los Angeles traffic was too fast and too slashingly murderous for me to be really happy under automatic control. I wanted to redesign their whole installation. It was not a really modern fail-safe. By the time we were west of Western Avenue and could go back on manual control, I was edgy and wanted a drink. There's an oasis, Pete. <coughs> right ahead. But while I was looking for a place to park, Los Angeles was safe from invasion. The invaders wouldn't find a place to park. I recalled the doctor's orders not to touch alcohol. So I told him emphatically what he could do with his orders. Then I wondered if he could tell almost a day later whether or not I had taken a drink. I seemed to recall some technical article, but it had not been in my line and I had just skimmed it. Damnation, he was quite capable of refusing to let me cold sleep. I'd better play it cagey and lay off the stuff. Meow, inquired Pete. Later. We're going to find a drive-in instead. I suddenly realized that I didn't really want a drink. I wanted food and a night's sleep. Doc was correct. I was more sober and felt better than I had in weeks. Maybe that shot in the fanny had been nothing but B-1. If so, it was jet-propelled. So we found a drive-in restaurant. I ordered chicken in the rough for me and a half a pound of hamburger and some milk for Pete and took him out for a short walk while it was coming. Pete and I ate in drive-ins a lot because I didn't have to sneak him in and out. A half hour later, I let the car drift back out of the busy circle, stopped it, lit a cigarette, scratched Pete under the chin, and thought, Dan, my boy, the doc was right. You've been trying to dive down the neck of a bottle. That's okay for your pointy head, but it's too narrow for your shoulders. Now you're cold sober, you've got your belly crammed with food, and it's resting comfortably for the first time in days. You feel better. What else? Was the doc right about the rest of it? Are you a spoiled infant? Do you lack the guts to stand up to a setback? 
Why are you taking this step? Is it the spirit of adventure? Or are you simply hiding from yourself like a Section 8 trying to crawl back into his mother's womb? But I do want to do it, I told myself. The year 2000. Boy! Okay, so you want to. But do you have to run off without settling the beefs you have right here? All right, all right. But how can I settle them? I don't want Belle back, not after what she's done. And what else can I do? Sue them? Don't be silly. I've got no evidence, and anyhow, nobody ever wins a lawsuit but the lawyers. Pete said, Well, you know... I looked down at his waffle-scarred head. Pete wouldn't sue anybody. If he didn't like the cut of another cat's whiskers, he simply invited him to come out and fight like a cat. I believe you're right, Pete. I'm going to look up Miles, tear his arm off, and beat him over the head with it until he talks. We can take the long sleep afterward. But we've got to know just what it was they did to us and who rigged it. There was a phone booth back of the stand. I called Miles, found him at home, and told him to stay there. I'd be out. My old man named me Daniel Boone Davis, which was his way of declaring for personal liberty and self-reliance. I was born in 1940, a year when everybody was saying that the individual was on the skids and the future belonged to mass man. Dad refused to believe it. Naming me was a note of defiance. He died under brainwashing in North Korea, trying to the last to prove his thesis. When the Six Weeks War came along, I had a degree in mechanical engineering and was in the army. I had not used my degree to try for a commission because the one thing Dad had left me was an overpowering yen to be on my own, giving no orders, taking no orders, keeping no schedules. I simply wanted to serve my hitch and get out. When the Cold War boiled over, I was a sergeant technician at Sandia Weapons Center in New Mexico, stuffing atoms in atom bombs and planning what I would do when my time was up. The day Sandia disappeared, I was down in Dallas, drawing a fresh supply of Shreklikite. The fallout on that was toward Oklahoma City, so I lived to draw my GI benefits. Pete lived through it for a similar reason. I had a buddy, Miles Gentry, a veteran called back to duty. He had married a widow with one daughter, but his wife had died about the time he was called back. He lived off post with a family in Albuquerque so as to have a home for his stepchild, Frederica. Little Ricky, we never called her Frederica, took care of Pete for me. Thanks to the cat goddess Bubastis, Miles and Ricky and Pete were away on a 72 that awful weekend. Ricky took Pete with them because I could not take him to Dallas. I was as surprised as anyone when it turned out we had divisions stashed away at Thule and other places that no one suspected. It had been known since the 30s that the human body could be chilled until it slowed down to almost nothing. But it had been a laboratory trick, or a last resort therapy until the Six Weeks War. I'll say this for military research. If money and men can do it, it gets results. Print another billion, hire another thousand scientists and engineers, then, in some incredible left-handed, inefficient fashion, the answers come up. Stasis, cold sleep, hibernation, hypothermia, reduced metabolism, call it what you will. The logistics medicine research teams had found a way to stack people like cordwood and use them when needed. First, you drug the subject, then hypnotize him, then cool him down and hold him precisely at four degrees centigrade, that is to say, at the maximum density of water with no ice crystals. If you need him in a hurry, he can be brought up by diathermy and post-hypnotic command in ten minutes. They did it in seven at Nome. But such speed tends to age the tissues and may make him a little stupid from then on. If you aren't in a hurry, two hours minimum is better. The quick method is what professional soldiers call a calculated risk. The whole thing was a risk the enemy had not calculated, so when the war was over I was paid off instead of being liquidated or sent to a slave camp, and Miles and I went into business together about the time the insurance companies started selling cold sleep. We went to the Mojave Desert, set up a small factory in an Air Force surplus building, and started making Hired Girl, my engineering and Miles's law and business experience. 
Yes, I invented Hired Girl and all her kinfolk, Window Willie and the rest, even though you won't find my name on them. While I was in the service, I had thought hard about what one engineer can do. Go to work for Standard or DuPont or General Motors? Thirty years later, they give you a testimonial dinner and a pension. You haven't missed any meals. You've had a lot of rides in company airplanes. But you are never your own boss. The other big market for engineers is civil service. Good starting pay, good pensions, no worries, 30 days annual leave, liberal benefits. But I had just had a long government vacation and wanted to be my own boss. What was there small enough for one engineer and not requiring six million man-hours before the first model was on the market? Bicycle shop engineering with peanuts for capital, the way Ford and the Wright brothers had started. People said those days were gone forever. I didn't believe it. Automation was booming. Chemical engineering plants that required only two gauge watchers and a guard. Machines that printed tickets in one city and marked the space sold in six other cities. Steel moles that mined coal while the UMW boys sat back and watched. So while I was on Uncle Sam's payroll, I soaked up all the electronics, linkages, and cybernetics that a Q clearance would permit. What was the last thing to go automatic? Answer, any housewife's house. I didn't attempt to figure out a sensible scientific house. Women didn't want one. They simply wanted a better upholstered cave. But housewives were still complaining about the servant problem long after servants had gone the way of the mastodon. I had rarely met a housewife who did not have a touch of slaveholder in her. They seemed to think there really ought to be strapping peasant girls grateful for a chance to scrub floors fourteen hours a day and eat table scraps at wages a plumber's helper would scorn. That's why we called the monster Hired Girl. It brought back thoughts of the semi-slave immigrant girl whom Grandma used to bully. Basically, it was just a better vacuum cleaner, and we planned to market it at a price competitive with ordinary suck brooms. What Hired Girl would do, the first model, not the semi-intelligent robot I developed it into, was to clean floors, any floor, all day long and without supervision. And there never was a floor that didn't need cleaning. It swept, or mopped, or vacuum cleaned, or polished consulting tapes in its idiot memory to decide which. Anything larger than a BB shot it picked up and placed in a tray on its upper surface for someone brighter to decide whether to keep or throw away. It went quietly looking for dirt all day long in search curves that could miss nothing, passing over clean floors in its endless search for dirty floors. It would get out of a room with people in it like a well-trained maid, unless its mistress caught up with it and flipped a switch to tell the poor thing it was welcome. Around dinner time, it would go to its stall and soak up a quick charge. This was before we installed the everlasting power pack. There was not too much difference between Hired Girl Mark I and a vacuum cleaner, but the difference, that it would clean without supervision, was enough. It sold. I swiped the basic prowl pattern from the electric turtles that were written up in Scientific America in the late 40s, lifted a memory circuit out of the brain of a guided missile. That's the nice thing about top-secret gimmicks. They don't get patented. And I took the cleaning devices and linkages out of a dozen things, including a floor polisher used in army hospitals, a soft drink dispenser, and those hands they use in atomic plants to handle anything hot. There wasn't anything really new in it. It was just the way I put it together. The spark of genius required by our laws lay in getting a good patent lawyer. The real genius was in the production engineering. The whole thing could be built with standard parts ordered out of Sweet's catalog, with the exception of two three-dimensional cams and one printed circuit. The circuit we subcontracted, the cams I made myself in the shed we called our factory, using war surplus automated tools. At first, Miles and I were the whole assembly line, bash to fit, file to hide, paint to cover. The pilot model cost $4,317.09. The first hundred cost just over $39 each, 
and we passed them on to a Los Angeles discount house at $60, and they sold them for $85. We had to let them go on consignment to unload them at all, since we could not afford sales promotion, and we darn near starved before receipts started coming in. Then life ran a two-page on Hired Girl, and it was a case of having enough help to assemble the monster. Belle Darkin joined us soon after that. Miles and I had been pecking out letters on a 1908 Underwood. We hired her as a typewriter jockey and bookkeeper and rented an electric machine with executive typeface and carbon ribbon, and I designed a letterhead. We were plowing it all back into the business, and Pete and I were sleeping in the shop while Miles and Ricky had a nearby shack. We incorporated in self-defense. It takes three to incorporate. We gave Bell a share of stock and designated her secretary treasurer. Miles was president and general manager. I was chief engineer and chairman of the board, with 51% of the stock. I want to make clear why I kept control. I wasn't a hog. I simply wanted to be my own boss. Miles worked like a trooper. I give him credit. But better than 60% of the savings that got us started were mine, and 100% of the inventiveness and engineering were mine. Miles could not possibly have built Hired Girl, whereas I could have built it with any of a dozen partners, or possibly without one, although I might have flopped in trying to make money out of it. Miles was a businessman, while I am not. But I wanted to be certain that I retained control of the shop, and I granted Miles equal freedom in the business end. Too much freedom, it turned out. Hired Girl Mark I was selling like beer at a ball game, and I was kept busy for a while improving it and setting up a real assembly line and putting a shop master in charge. Then I happily turned to thinking up more household gadgets. Amazingly, little real thought had been given to housework, even though it is at least 50% of all work in the world. The women's magazines talked about labor saving in the home and functional kitchens, but it was just prattle. Their pretty pictures showed living working arrangements essentially no better than those in Shakespeare's day. The horse to jet plane revolution had not reached the home. I stuck to my conviction that housewives were reactionaries. No machines for living, just gadgets to replace the extinct domestic servant, that is, for cleaning, cooking, and baby tending. I got to thinking about dirty windows and that ring around the bathtub that is so hard to scrub, as you have to bend double to get at it. It turned out that an electrostatic device could make dirt go spung off any polished silica surface, window glass, bathtubs, toilet bowls, anything of that sort. That was Window Willie, and it's a wonder that somebody hadn't thought of him sooner. I held him back until I had him down to a price that people could not refuse. Do you know what window washing used to cost by the hour? I held Willie out of production much longer than suited Miles. He wanted to sell it as soon as it was cheap enough, but I insisted on one more thing— Willie had to be easy to repair. The great shortcoming of most household gadgets was that the better they were, and the more they did, the more certain they were to get out of order when you needed them most, and then require an expert at five dollars an hour to make them move again. Then the same thing will happen the following week, if not to the dishwasher, then to the air conditioner, usually late Saturday night during a snowstorm. I wanted my gadgets to work and keep on working, and not to cause ulcers in their owners. But gadgets do get out of order, even mine. Until that great day when all gadgets are designed with no moving parts, machinery will continue to go sour. If you stuff a house with gadgets, some of them will always be out of order. But military research does get results, and the military had licked this problem years earlier. You simply can't lose a battle, lose thousands or millions of lives, maybe the war itself, just because some gadget the size of your thumb breaks down. For military purposes, they used a lot of dodges, fail-safe, standby circuits, tell me three times, and so forth. But one they used that made sense for household equipment was the plug-in component principle. It is a moronically simple idea. Don't repair replace. 
I wanted to make every part of Window Willy which could go wrong a plug-in unit, then include a set of replacements with each Willy. Some components would be thrown away, some would be sent out for repair, but Willy himself would never break down longer than necessary to plug in the replacement part. Miles and I had our first row. I said the decision as to when to go from pilot model to production was an engineering one. He claimed that it was a business decision. If I hadn't retained control, Willie would have gone on the market just as maddeningly subject to acute appendicitis as all other sickly, half-engineered, labor-saving gadgets. Bell Darkin smoothed over the row. If she had turned on the pressure, I might have let Miles start selling Willie before I thought it was ready, for I was as goofed up about Bell as is possible for a man to be. Bell was not only a perfect secretary and office manager, she also had personal specs which would have delighted Praxiteles, and a fragrance which affected me the way catnip does Pete. With top-notch office girls as scarce as they were, when one of the best turns out to be willing to work for a shoestring company at a below-standard salary, one really ought to ask, why? But we didn't even ask where she had worked last. So happy were we to have her dig us out of the flood of paperwork that marketing hired girl had caused. Later on, I would have indignantly rejected any suggestion that we should have checked on Bell, for by then her bust measurement had seriously warped my judgment. She let me explain how lonely my life had been until she came along, and she answered gently that she would have to know me better, but that she was inclined to feel the same way. Shortly after she smoothed out the quarrel between Miles and myself, she agreed to share my fortunes. Dan, darling, you have it in you to be a great man, and I have hopes that I am the sort of woman who can help you. You certainly are. Shush, darling, but I am not going to marry you right now and burden you with kids and worry you to death. I am going to work with you and build up the business first. Then we'll get married. I objected, but she was firm. No, darling. We are going a long way, you and I. Hired girl will be as great a name as General Electric. But when we marry, I want to forget business and just devote myself to making you happy. But first, I must devote myself to your welfare and your future. Trust me, dear. So I did. She wouldn't let me buy her the expensive engagement ring I wanted to buy. Instead, I signed over to her some of my stock as a betrothal present. I went on voting it, of course. Thinking back, I'm not sure who thought of that present. I worked harder than ever after that, thinking about waste baskets that would empty themselves and a linkage to put dishes away after the dishwasher was through. Everybody was happy. Everybody but Pete and Ricky, that is. Pete ignored Bell, as he did anything he disapproved of but could not change. But Ricky was really unhappy. My fault. Ricky had been my girl since she was a six-year-old at Sandia, with hair ribbons and big solemn dark eyes. I was going to marry her when she grew up, and we would both take care of Pete. I thought it was a game we were playing, and perhaps it was— with little Ricky serious only to the extent that it offered her eventual full custody of our cat. But how can you tell what goes on in a child's mind? I am not sentimental about kids, little monsters, most of them, who don't civilize until they are grown and sometimes not then. But little Frederica reminded me of my own sister at that age, and besides, she liked Pete and treated him properly. I think she liked me because I never talked down— I had resented that myself as a child, and took her brownie activities seriously. Ricky was okay. She had quiet dignity, and was not a banger, not a squealer, not a lap climber. We were friends, sharing the responsibility for Pete, and, so far as I knew, her being my girl was just a sophisticated game we were playing. I quit playing it after my sister and mother got it the day they bombed us. No conscious decision, I just didn't feel like joking and never went back to it. Ricky was seven then. She was ten by the time Belle joined us and possibly eleven when Belle and I became engaged. 
She hated Bell with an intensity that I think only I was aware of, since it was expressed only by reluctance to talk to her. Bell called it shyness, and I think Miles thought it was, too. But I knew better and tried to talk Ricky out of it. Did you ever try to discuss with a sub-adolescent something the child does not want to talk about? You'll get more satisfaction shouting in Echo Canyon. I told myself it would wear off as Ricky learned how very lovable Bell was. Pete was another matter, and if I had not been in love, I would have seen it as a clear sign that Bell and I would never understand each other. Bell liked my cat, oh sure, sure. She adored cats, and she loved my incipient bald spot, and admired my choice in restaurants, and she liked everything about me. But liking cats is hard to fake to a cat person. There are cat people, and there are others, more than a majority probably, who cannot abide a harmless, necessary cat. If they try to pretend out of politeness or any other reason, it shows, because they don't understand how to treat cats, and cat protocol is more rigid than that of diplomacy. It is based on self-respect and mutual respect, and it has the same flavor as the dignidad de hombre of Latin America, which you may offend only at risk of your life. Cats have no sense of humor, they have terribly inflated egos, and they are very touchy. If somebody asked me why it was worth anyone's time to cater to them, I would be forced to answer that there is no logical reason. I would rather explain to someone who detests sharp cheeses why he ought to like Limburger. Nevertheless, I fully sympathize with the Mandarin who cut off a priceless embroidered sleeve because a kitten was sleeping on it. Belle tried to show that she liked Pete by treating him like a dog, so she got scratched. Then, being a sensible cat, he got out in a hurry and stayed out a long time, which was well as I would have smacked him, and Pete has never been smacked, not by me. Hitting a cat is worse than useless. A cat can be disciplined only by patience, never by blows. So I put iodine on Belle's scratches, then tried to explain what she had done wrong. I'm sorry it happened. I'm terribly sorry. But it will happen again if you do that again. But I was just petting him. Ah, uh, yes, but you weren't cat petting him. You were dog petting him. You must never pat a cat. You stroke it. You must never make sudden movements in range of its claws. You must never touch it without giving it a chance to see that you are about to, and you must always watch to see that it likes it. If it doesn't want to be petted, it will put up with a little out of politeness. Cats are very polite, but you can tell if it is merely enduring it and stop before its patience is exhausted. I hesitated. You don't like cats, do you? What? Why, how silly! Of course I like cats. But she added, I haven't been around them much, I suppose. She's pretty touchy, isn't she? He. Pete is a he-male cat. No, actually he's not touchy since he's always been well treated. But you do have to learn how to behave with cats. Uh, you must never laugh at them. What? Forevermore, why? Not because they aren't funny. They're extremely comical. But they have no sense of humor, and it offends them. Oh, a cat won't scratch you for laughing. He'll simply stalk off and you'll have trouble making friends with him. But it's not too important. Knowing how to pick up a cat is much more important. When Pete comes back in, I'll show you how. But Pete didn't come back in. Not then. And I never showed her. Belle didn't touch him after that. She spoke to him and acted as if she liked him, but she kept her distance and he kept his. I put it out of my mind. I couldn't let so trivial a thing make me doubt the woman who was more to me than anything in life. But the subject of Pete almost reached a crisis later. Belle and I were discussing where we were going to live. She still wouldn't set the date, but we spent a lot of time on such details. I wanted a ranchette near the plant. She favored a flat in town until we could afford a Bel Air estate. I said, Darling, it's not practical. I've got to be near the plant. Besides, did you ever try to take care of a tomcat in a city apartment? Oh, that. Look, darling, I'm glad you mentioned it. I've been studying up on cats. I really have. 
will have him altered. Then he'll be much gentler and perfectly happy in a flat. I stared at her, unable to believe my ears. Make a eunuch of that old warrior? Change him into a fireside decoration? Bell, you don't know what you're saying. She tut-tutted me with the old familiar mother knows best, giving the stock arguments of people who mistake cats for property, how it wouldn't hurt him, that it was really for his own good, how she knew how much I valued him, and she would never think of depriving me of him, how it was really very simple and quite safe and better for everybody. I cut in on her. Why don't you arrange it for both of us? What, dear? Me too. I'd be much more docile and I'd stay home nights and I'd never argue with you. As you pointed out, it doesn't hurt and I'd probably be a lot happier. She turned red. You're being preposterous. So are you. She never mentioned it again. Bell never let a difference of opinion degenerate into a row. She shut up and bided her time. But she never gave up, either. In some ways, she had a lot of cat in her, which may have been why I couldn't resist her. I was glad to drop the matter. I was up to here in Flexible Frank. Willie and Hired Girl were bound to make us lots of money, but I had a bee in my bonnet about the perfect all-work household automaton, the general purpose servant. All right, call it a robot, though that is a much-abused word, and I had no notion of building a mechanical man. I wanted a gadget which could do anything inside the home, cleaning and cooking, of course, but also really hard jobs, like changing a baby's diaper or replacing a typewriter ribbon. Instead of a stable of hired girls and window willies and nursemaid nans and houseboy harrys and gardener gusses, I wanted a man and wife to be able to buy one machine for, oh, say, about the price of a good automobile, which would be the equal of the Chinese servant you read about, but no one in my generation had ever seen. If I could do that, it would be the Second Emancipation Proclamation, freeing women from their age-old slavery. I wanted to abolish the old saw about how women's work is never done. Housekeeping is repetitious and unnecessary drudgery. As an engineer, it offended me. For the problem to be within the scope of one engineer, almost all of Flexible Frank had to be standard parts and must not involve any new principles. Basic research is no job for one man alone. This had to be development from former art or I couldn't do it. Fortunately, there was an awful lot of former art in engineering, and I had not wasted my time while under a Q clearance. What I wanted wasn't as complicated as the things a guided missile was required to do. Just what did I want Flexible Frank to do? Answer. Any work a human being does around a house. He didn't have to play cards, make love, eat, or sleep, but he did have to clean up after the card game, cook, make beds, and tend babies. At least he had to keep track of a baby's breathing and call someone if it changed. I decided he did not have to answer telephone calls as AT&T was already renting a gadget for that. There was no need for him to answer the door either, as most new houses were being equipped with door answerers. But to do the multitude of things I wanted him to do, he had to have hands, eyes, ears, and a brain. A good enough brain. Hands I could order from the atomics engineering equipment companies who supplied hired girls' hands. Only this time I would want the best, with wide-range servos and with the delicate feedback required for microanalysis manipulations and for weighing radioactive isotopes. The same companies could supply eyes, only they could be simpler, since Frank would not have to see and manipulate from behind yards of concrete shielding the way they do in a reactor plant. The ears I could buy from any of a dozen radio TV houses, though I might have to do some circuit designing to have his hands controlled simultaneously by sight, sound, and touch feedback the way the human hand is controlled. But you can do an awful lot in a small space with transistors and printed circuits. Frank wouldn't have to use stepladders. I would make his neck stretch like an ostrich and his arms extend like lazy tongs. Should I make him able to go up and down stairs? Well, there was a powered wheelchair that could. 
Maybe I should buy one and use it for the chassis, limiting the pilot model to a space no bigger than a wheelchair and no heavier than such a chair could carry. That would give me a set of parameters. I'd tie its power and steering into Frank's brain. The brain was the real hitch. You can build a gadget linked like a man's skeleton, or even much better. You can give it a feedback control system good enough to drive nails, scrub floors, crack eggs, or not crack eggs. But unless it has that stuff between the ears that a man has, it is not a man. It's not even a corpse. Fortunately, I didn't need a human brain. I just wanted a docile moron, capable of largely repetitive household jobs. Here is where the Thorson memory tubes came in. The intercontinental missiles we had struck back with thought with Thorson tubes, and traffic control systems in places like Los Angeles used an idiot form of them. No need to go into theory of an electronic tube that even Bell Labs doesn't understand too well. The point is that you can hook a Thorson tube into a control circuit, direct the machine through an operation by manual control, and the tube will remember what was done and can direct the operation without a human supervisor a second time or any number of times. For an automated machine tool, this is enough. For guided missiles and for flexible Frank, you add side circuits that give the machine judgment. Actually, it isn't judgment. In my opinion, a machine can never have judgment. The side circuit is a hunting circuit, the programming of which says, look for so-and-so within such-and-such such limits. When you find it, carry out your basic instruction. The basic instruction can be as complicated as you can crowd into one Thorson memory tube, which is a very wide limit indeed. And you can program so that your judgment circuits, moronic backseat drivers they are, can interrupt the basic instructions any time the cycle does not match that originally impressed into the Thorson tube. This meant that you need cause flexible Frank to clear the table and scrape the dishes and load them into the dishwasher only once, and from then on he could cope with any dirty dishes he ever encountered. Better still, he could have an electronically duplicated Thorson tube stuck into his head and could handle dirty dishes the first time he ever encountered them, and never break a dish. Stick another memorized tube alongside the first one, and he could change a wet baby first time and never, never, never stick a pin in the baby. Frank's square head could easily hold a hundred Thorson tubes, each with an electronic memory of a different household task. Then throw a guard circuit around all the judgment circuits. A circuit which required him to hold still and squall for help if he ran into something not covered by his instructions. That way you wouldn't use up babies or dishes. So I did build Frank on the framework of a powered wheelchair. He looked like a hat rack making love to an octopus, but boy how he could polish silverware. Miles looked over the first Frank, watched him mix a martini and serve it, then go around emptying and polishing ashtrays, never touching ones that were clean, open a window and fasten it open, then go to my bookcase and dust and tidy the books in it. Miles took a sip of his martini and said, Too much vermouth. It's the way I like them. But we can tell him to fix yours one way and mine another. He's got plenty of blank tubes in him. Flexible. Miles took another sip. How soon can he be engineered for production? Ah, uh, I'd like to fiddle with him for about ten years. Before he could groan, I added, But we ought to be able to put a limited model into production in five. Nonsense! We'll get you plenty of help and have a Model T job ready in six months. The devil you will! This is my magnum opus. I'm not going to turn him loose until he is a work of art. About a third that size, everything plug-in replaceable but the Thorsons, and so all-out flexible that he'll not only wind the cat and wash the baby, he'll even play ping-pong if the buyer wants to pay for the extra programming. I looked at him. Frank was quietly dusting my desk and putting every paper back exactly where he found it. But ping-pong with him wouldn't be much fun. He'd never miss. No, I suppose we could teach him to miss with a random-choice circuit. Hmm, yes, we could. 
We will. It would make a nice selling demonstration. One year, Dan, and not a day over. I'm going to hire somebody away from Lowy to help you with the styling. I said, Miles, when are you going to learn that I boss the engineering? Once I turn him over to you, he's yours, but not a split second before. Miles answered, It's still too much vermouth. I piddled along with the help of the shop mechanics until I had Frank looking less like a three-car crash and more like something you might want to brag about to the neighbors. In the meantime, I smoothed a lot of bugs out of his control system. I even taught him to stroke Pete and scratch him under the chin in such a fashion that Pete liked it. And believe me, that takes negative feedback as exact as anything used in atomics labs. Miles didn't crowd me, although he came in from time to time and watched the progress. I did most of my work at night, coming back after dinner with Belle and taking her home. Then I would sleep most of the day, arrive late in the afternoon, sign whatever papers Belle had for me, see what the shop had done during the day, then take Belle out to dinner again. I didn't try to do much before then, because creative work makes a man stink like a goat. After a hard night in the lab shop, nobody could stand me but Pete. Just as we were finishing dinner one day, Belle said to me, Going back to the shop, dear? Sure, why not? Good, because Miles is going to meet us there. Huh? He wants a stockholders meeting. A stockholders meeting? Why? It won't take long. Actually, dear, you haven't been paying much attention to the firm's business lately. Miles wants to gather up loose ends and settle some policies. I've been sticking close to the engineering. What else am I supposed to do for the firm? Nothing, dear. Miles says it won't take long. What's the trouble? Can't Jake handle the assembly line? Please, dear. Miles didn't tell me why. Finish your coffee. Miles was waiting for us at the plant and shook hands as solemnly as if we had not met in a month. I said, Miles, what's this all about? He turned to Bell. Get the agenda, will you? This alone should have told me that Bell had been lying when she claimed that Miles had not told her what he had in mind. But I did not think of it. Hell, I trusted Bell, and my attention was distracted by something else, for Bell went to the safe, spun the knob, and opened it. I said, By the way, dear, I tried to open that last night and couldn't. Have you changed the combination? She was hauling papers out and did not turn. Didn't I tell you? The patrol asked me to change it after that burglar scare last week. Oh, you'd better give me the new numbers or some night I'll have to phone one of you at a ghastly hour. Certainly. She closed the safe and put a folder on the table we used for conferences. Miles cleared his throat and said, Let's get started. I answered, Okay. Darling, if this is a formal meeting, I guess you had better make pothooks. Uh, Wednesday, November 18th, 1970, 9.20 p.m., all stockholders present, put our names down, D.B. Davis, chairman of the board and presiding. Any old business? There wasn't any. Okay, Miles, it's your show. Any new business? Miles cleared his throat. I want to review the firm's policies, present a program for the future, and have the board consider a financing proposal. Financing? Don't be silly. We're in the black and doing better every month. What's the matter, Miles? Dissatisfied with your drawing account? We could boost it. We wouldn't stay in the black under the new program. We need a broader capital structure. What new program? Please, Dan. I've gone to the trouble of writing it up in detail. Let Bell read it to us. Well, okay. Skipping the gobbledygook, like all lawyers, Miles was fond of polysyllables, Miles wanted to do three things. A. Take flexible Frank away from me, hand it over to a production engineering team, and get it on the market without delay. B. But I stopped it at that point. No. Wait a minute, Dan. As president and general manager, I'm certainly entitled to present my ideas in an orderly manner. Save your comments. Let Bell finish reading. Well, all right, but the answer is still no. Point B was in effect that we should quit frittering around as a one-horse outfit. 
We had a big thing, as big as the automobile had been, and we were in at the start. Therefore, we should at once expand and set up organization for nationwide and worldwide selling and distribution, with production to match. I started drumming on the table. I could just see myself as chief engineer of an outfit like that. They probably wouldn't even let me have a drafting table, and if I picked up a soldering gun, the Union would pull a strike. I might as well have stayed in the Army and tried to make general. But I didn't interrupt. Point C was that we couldn't do this on pennies. It would take millions. Mannix Enterprises would put up the dough. What it amounted to was that we would sell out to Mannix Lock, Stock, and Flexible Frank and become a daughter corporation. Miles would stay on as division manager and I would stay on as chief research engineer. But the three old days would be gone. We'd both be hired hands. Is that all? I said. Mmm, yes. Let's discuss it and take a vote. There ought to be something in there granting us the right to sit in front of the cabin at night and sing spirituals. This is no joke, Dan. This is how it's got to be. I wasn't joking. A slave needs privileges to keep him quiet. Okay, is it my turn? Go ahead. I put up a counterproposal, one that had been growing in my mind. I wanted us to get out of production. Jake Schmidt, our production shopmaster, was a good man. Nevertheless, I was forever being jerked out of a warm, creative fog to straighten out bugs in production, which is like being dumped out of a warm bed into ice water. This was the real reason why I had been doing so much night work and staying away from the shop in the daytime. With more war surplus buildings being moved in and a night shift contemplated, I could see the time coming when I would get no peace to create, even though we turned down this utterly unpalatable plan to rub shoulders with General Motors and Consolidated. I certainly was not twins. I couldn't be both inventor and production manager. So I proposed that we get smaller instead of bigger. License hired girl and window willy, let someone else build and sell them while we raked in the royalties. When Flexible Frank was ready, we would license him, too. If Mannix wanted the licenses and would outbid the market, swell. Meantime, we'd change our name to Davis and Gentry Research Corporation and hold it down to just the three of us, with a machinist or two to help me jackleg new gadgets. Miles and Bell could sit back and count the money as it rolled in. Miles shook his head slowly. No, Dan. Licensing would make us some money granted, but not nearly the money we would make if we did it ourselves. Confound it, Miles! We wouldn't be doing it ourselves. That's just the point. We'd be selling our souls to the Mannix people. As for money, how much do you want? You can only use one yacht or one swimming pool at a time, and you'll have both before the year is out if you want them. I don't want them. What do you want? He looked up. Dan, you want to invent things. This plan lets you do so, with all the facilities and all the help and all the expense money in the world. Me? I want to run a big business. A big business. I've got the talent for it. He glanced at Bell. I don't want to spend my life sitting out here in the middle of the Mojave Desert acting as business manager to one lonely inventor. I stared at him. You didn't talk that way at Sandia. You want out, Pappy? Bell and I would hate to see you go, but if that is the way you feel, I guess I could mortgage the place or something and buy you out. I wouldn't want any man to feel tied down. I was shocked to my heels, but if old Miles was restless, I had no right to hold him to my pattern. No, I don't want out. I want us to grow. You heard my proposal. It's a formal motion for action by the corporation. I so move. I guess I looked puzzled. You insist on doing it the hard way? Okay, Bell, the vote is no. Record it. But I won't put up my counterproposal tonight. We'll talk it over and exchange views. I want you to be happy, Miles. Miles said stubbornly, Let's do this properly. Roll call, Bell. Very well, sir. Miles Gentry, voting stock shares number... She read off the serial numbers. How say you? I. She wrote it in her book. Daniel B. Davis, voting stock shares number... She read off a string of telephone numbers again. 
I didn't listen to the formality. How say you? No, and that settles it. I'm sorry, Miles. Bell S. Darkin, she went on, voting shares number... She recited figures again. I vote I. My mouth dropped open. Then I managed to stop gasping and say, But baby, you can't do that. Those are your shares, sure, but you know perfectly well that... Announce the tally, Miles growled. The eyes have it. The proposal is carried. Record it. Yes, sir. The next few minutes were confused. First I yelled at her, then I reasoned with her, then I snarled and told her that what she had done was not honest. True, I had assigned the stock to her, but she knew as well as I did that I always voted it, that I had had no intention of parting with control of the company, that it was an engagement present, pure and simple. Hell, I had even paid the income tax on it last April. If she could pull a stunt like this when we were engaged, what was our marriage going to be like? She looked right at me, and her face was utterly strange to me. Dan Davis, if you think we are still engaged after the way you have talked to me, you are even stupider than I've always known you were. She turned to Gentry. Will you take me home, Miles? Certainly, my dear. I started to say something, then shut up and stalked out of there without my hat. It was high time to leave, or I would probably have killed Miles, since I couldn't touch Bell. I didn't sleep, of course. About 4 a.m. I got out of bed, made phone calls, agreed to pay more than it was worth, and by 5.30 was in front of the plant with a pickup truck. I went to the gate, intending to unlock it and drive the truck to the loading dock so that I could run flexible Frank over the tailgate. Frank weighed 400 pounds. There was a new padlock on the gate. I shinnied over, cutting myself on barbed wire. Once inside, the gate would give me no trouble, as there were a hundred tools in the shop capable of coping with a padlock. But the lock on the front door had been changed, too. I was looking at it, deciding whether it was easier to break a window with a tire iron or get the jack out of the trunk and brace it between the door frame and the knob, when somebody shouted, Hey, you! Hands up! I didn't put my hands up, but I turned around. A middle-aged man was pointing a hog leg at me big enough to bombard a city. Who the devil are you? Who are you? I'm Dan Davis, chief engineer of this outfit. Oh. He relaxed a little, but still aimed the field mortar at me. Yeah, you match the description, but if you have any identification on you, better let me see it. Why should I? I asked who you are. Me? Nobody you'd know. Name of Joe Todd with the Desert Protective and Patrol Company. Private license. You ought to know who we are. We've had you folks as clients for the night patrol for months. But tonight I'm on as special guard. You are? Then if they gave you a key to the place, use it. I want to get in. And quit pointing that blunderbuss at me. He still kept it leveled at me. I couldn't rightly do that, Mr. Davis. First place, I don't have a key. Second place, I had particular orders about you. You aren't to go in. I'll let you out the gate. I want the gate opened all right, but I'm going in. I looked around for a rock to break a window. Please, Mr. Davis. Huh? I'd hate to see you insist. I really would, because I couldn't chance shooting you in the legs. I ain't a very good shot. I'd have to shoot you in the belly. I've got soft-nosed bullets in this iron. It'd be pretty messy. I suppose that was what changed my mind, though I would like to think it was something else, i.e. when I looked again through the window I saw that Flexible Frank was not where I had left him. As he let me out the gate, Todd handed me an envelope. They said to give this to you if you showed up. I read it in the cab of the truck. It said, 18 November, 1970. Dear Mr. Davis, at a regular meeting of the Board of Directors held this date, it was voted to terminate all your connection, other than as stockholder, with the corporation, as permitted under paragraph 3 of your contract. It is requested that you stay off company property. Your personal papers and belongings will be forwarded to you by safe means. 
The board wishes to thank you for your services and regrets the differences in policy opinion which have forced this step on us. Sincerely yours, Miles Gentry, Chairman of the Board and General Manager, by B.S. Darkin, Secretary Treasurer. I read it twice before I recalled that I had never had any contract with the corporation under which to invoke paragraph 3 or any other paragraph. Later that day, a bonded messenger delivered a package to the motel where I kept my clean underwear. It contained my hat, my desk pen, my other slide rule, a lot of books and personal correspondence, and a number of documents. But it did not contain my notes and drawings for Flexible Frank. Some of the documents were very interesting. My contract, for example. Sure enough, paragraph 3 let them fire me without notice subject to three months' salary. But paragraph 7 was even more interesting. It was the latest form of the yellow dog clause, one in which the employee agrees to refrain from engaging in a competing occupation for five years by letting his former employers pay him cash to option his services on a first refusal basis i.e., I could go back to work any time I wanted just by going, hat in hand, and asking Miles and Bell for a job. Maybe that was why they sent the hat back. But for five long years I could not work on household appliances without asking them first. I would rather have cut my throat. There were copies of assignments of all patents duly registered from me to Hired Girl, Inc., for Hired Girl and Window Willie and a couple of minor things. Flexible Frank, of course, had never been patented. Well, I didn't think he had been patented. I found out the truth later. But I had never assigned any patents. I hadn't even formally licensed their use to Hired Girl, Inc. The corporation was my own creature, and there hadn't seemed to be any hurry about it. The last three items were my stock shares certificate, those I had not given to Bell, a certified check, and a letter explaining each item of the check. Accumulated salary, less drawing account disbursements, three months extra salary in lieu of notice, option money to invoke paragraph seven, and a thousand dollar bonus to express appreciation of services rendered. That last was real sweet of them. While I reread that amazing collection, I had time to realize that I had probably not been too bright to sign everything that Bell put in front of me. There was no possible doubt that the signatures were mine. I steadied down enough the next day to talk it over with a lawyer, a very smart and money-hungry lawyer, one who didn't mind kicking and clapper-clawing and biting in the clinches. At first he was anxious to take it on a contingent fee basis, but after he finished looking over my exhibits and listening to the details, he sat back and laced his fingers over his belly and looked sour. Dan, I'm going to give you some advice, and it's not going to cost you anything. Well, do nothing. You haven't got a prayer. But you said, I know what I said. They rooked you, but how can you prove it? They were too smart to steal your stock or cut you off without a penny. They gave you exactly the deal you could have reasonably expected if everything had been kosher and you had quit or had been fired over, as they express it, a difference of policy opinion. They gave you everything you had coming to you, and a measly thousand to boot just to show there are no hard feelings. But I didn't have a contract, and I never assigned those patents. These papers say you did. You admit that's your signature. Can you prove what you say by anyone else? I thought about it. I certainly could not. Not even Jake Schmidt knew anything that went on in the front office. The only witnesses I had were Miles and Bell. Now about that stock assignment, he went on, that's the one chance to break the logjam. If you... But that is the only transaction in the whole stack that really is legitimate. I signed over that stock to her. Yes, but why? You say that you gave it to her as an engagement present in expectation of marriage. Never mind how she voted it, that's beside the point. If you can prove that it was given as a betrothal gift in full expectation of marriage, and that she knew it when she accepted it, you can force her either to marry you or to disgorge. McNulty versus Rhodes. Then you're in control again and kick them out. 
Can you prove it? Damn it, I don't want to marry her now. I wouldn't have her. That's your problem. But one thing at a time. Have you any witnesses or any evidence, letters or anything, which would tend to show that she accepted it, understanding that you were giving it to her as your future wife? I thought. Sure, I had witnesses. The same old two, Miles and Bell. You see, with nothing but your word against both of theirs, plus a pile of written evidence, you not only won't get anywhere, but you might wind up committed to a Napoleon factory with a diagnosis of paranoia. My advice to you is to get a job in some other line, or at the very most go ahead and buck their yellow dog contract by setting up a competitive business. I'd like to see that phraseology tested as long as I didn't have to fight it myself. But don't charge them with conspiracy. They'll win. Then they'll sue you and clean you out of what they let you keep. He stood up. I took only part of his advice. There was a bar on the ground floor of the same building. I went in and had a couple or nine drinks. I had plenty of time to recall all this while I was driving out to see Miles. Once we had started making money, he had moved Ricky and himself to a nice little rental in San Fernando Valley to get out of the murderous Mojave heat, and had started commuting via the Air Force slot. Ricky wasn't there now, I was happy to recall. She was up at Big Bear Lake at Girl Scout Camp. I didn't want a chance Ricky's being witness to a row between me and her stepdaddy. I was bumper to bumper in Sepulveda Tunnel when it occurred to me that it would be smart to get the certificate for my hired girl stock off my person before going to see Miles. I did not expect any rough stuff unless I started it, but it just seemed a good idea. Like a cat who has had his tail caught in the screen door once, I was permanently suspicious. Leave it in the car? Suppose I was hauled in for assault and battery. It wouldn't be smart to have it in the car when the car was towed in and impounded. I could mail it to myself, but I had been getting my mail lately from general delivery at the GPO, while shifting from hotel to hotel as often as they found out I was keeping a cat. I had better mail it to someone I could trust. But that was a mighty short list. Then I remembered someone I could trust. Ricky! I may seem a glutton for punishment to decide to trust one female just after I had been clipped by another, but the cases are not parallel. I had known Ricky half her life, and if there ever was a human being honest as a Joe Block, Ricky was she, and Pete thought so too. Besides, Ricky didn't have physical specifications capable of warping a man's judgment. Her femininity was only in her face, it hadn't affected her figure yet. When I managed to escape from the log jam in Sepulveda Tunnel, I got off the thruway and found a drug store. There I bought stamps and a big and a little envelope and some note paper. I wrote to her, Dear Ricky Ticky Tavi, I hope to see you soon, but until I do, I want you to keep this inside envelope for me. It's a secret, just between you and me. I stopped and thought, Doggone it, if anything happened to me... Oh, even a car crash or anything that can stop breathing, while Ricky had this, eventually it would wind up with Miles and Bell, unless I rigged things to prevent it. I realized as I thought about it that I had subconsciously reached a decision about the cold sleep deal. I wasn't going to take it. Sobering up and the lecture the doc had read me had stiffened my spine. I wasn't going to run away. I was going to stay and fight." and this stock certificate was my best weapon. It gave me the right to examine the books. It entitled me to poke my nose into any and all affairs of the company. If they tried again simply to keep me out with a hired guard, I could go back next time with a lawyer and a deputy sheriff and a court order. I could drag them into court with it, too. Maybe I couldn't win, but I could make a stink and perhaps cause the Mannix people to shy off from buying them out. Maybe I shouldn't send it to Ricky at all. No, if anything happened to me, I wanted her to have it. Ricky and Pete were all the family I had. I went on writing. If by any chance I don't see you for a year, you'll know something has happened to me. If that happens, take care of Pete, if you can find him. And without telling anybody, take the inside envelope to a branch of the Bank of America, give it to the trust officer, and tell him to open it. Love and Kisses, 
Uncle Danny. Then I took another sheet and wrote, 3 December 1970, Los Angeles, California. For one dollar in hand received and other valuable considerations, I assign... Here I listed legal descriptions and serial numbers of my hired girl, Inc. stock shares, to the Bank of America in trust for Frederica Virginia Gentry, and to be reassigned to her on her 21st birthday, and signed it. The intent was clear, and it was the best I could do on a drugstore counter with a jukebox blaring in my ear. It should make sure that Ricky got the stock if anything happened to me, while making darn sure that Miles and Bell could not grab it away from her. But if all went well, I would just ask Ricky to give the envelope back to me when I got around to it. By not using the assignment form printed on the back of the certificate, I avoided all the red tape of having a miner assign it back to me. I could just tear up the separate sheet of paper. I sealed the stock certificate with the note assigning it into the smaller envelope, placed it and the letter to Ricky in the larger envelope, addressed it to Ricky at the Girl Scout camp, stamped it, and dropped it in the box outside the drugstore. I noted that it would be picked up in about forty minutes and climbed back into my car feeling positively light-hearted, not because I had safeguarded the stock, but because I had solved my greater problems. Well, not solved them, perhaps, but had decided to face them, not run off and crawl in a hole to play Rip Van Winkle, nor try to blot them out again with ethanol in various flavors. Sure, I wanted to see the year 2000, but just by sitting tight, I would see it, when I was sixty, and still young enough probably to whistle at the girls. No hurry. Jumping to the next century in one long nap wouldn't be satisfactory to a normal man anyhow. About like seeing the end of a movie without having seen what goes before. The thing to do with the next thirty years was to enjoy them while they unfolded. Then, when I came to the year two thousand, I would understand it. In the meantime, I was going to have one Lulu of a fight with Miles and Bell. Maybe I wouldn't win, but I would sure let them know they had been in a scrap. Like the times Pete had come home bleeding in six directions, but insisting loudly, You ought to see the other cat. I didn't expect much out of this interview tonight. All it would amount to was a formal declaration of war. I planned to ruin Miles' sleep. And he could phone Bell and ruin hers. 3. By the time I got to Miles' house I was whistling. I had quit worrying about that precious pair and had worked out in my head, in the last fifteen miles, two brand new gadgets, either one of which could make me rich. One was a drafting machine to be operated like an electric typewriter. I guess there must be easily 50,000 engineers in the U.S. alone bending over drafting boards every day and hating it, because it gets you in your kidneys and ruins your eyes. Not that they didn't want a design, they did want to, but physically it was much too hard work. This gizmo would let them sit down in a big easy chair and tap keys and have the picture unfold on an easel above the keyboard. Depress three keys simultaneously and have a horizontal line appear just where you want it. Depress another key and you fillet it in with a vertical line. Depress two keys and then two more in succession and draw a line at an exact slant. Cripes, for a small additional cost as an accessory, I could add a second easel, let the architect design an isometric, the only easy way to design, and have the second picture come out in perfect perspective rendering without his even looking at it. Why, I could even set the thing to pull floor plans and elevations right out of the isometric. The beauty of it was that it could be made almost entirely with standard parts, most of them available at radio shops and camera stores. All but the control board, that is, and I was sure I could breadboard a rig for that by buying an electric typewriter, tearing its guts out, and hooking the keys to operate these other circuits. A month to make a primitive model, six weeks more to chase bugs but that one I just tucked away in the back of my mind, certain that I could do it, and that it would have a market. The thing that really delighted me was that I had figured out a way to outflex poor old flexible Frank. I knew more about Frank than anyone else could learn, even if they studied him a year. What they could not know, what even my notes did not show, 
was that there was at least one workable alternative for every choice I had made, and that my choices had been constrained by thinking of him as a household servant. To start with, I could throw away the restriction that he had to live in a powered wheelchair. From there on, I could do anything, except that I would need the Thorson memory tubes. And Miles could not keep me from using those. They were on the market for anyone who wanted to design a cybernetic sequence. The drafting machine could wait. I'd get busy on the unlimited all-purpose automaton, capable of being programmed for anything a man could do, just as long as it did not require true human judgment. No, I'd rig a drafting machine first, then use it to design Protean Pete. How about that, Pete? We're going to name the world's first real robot after you. <coughs> Don't be so suspicious. It's an honor. After breaking in on Frank, I could design Pete right at my drafting machine, really refine it, and quickly. I'd make it a killer, a triple-threat demon that would displace Frank before they even got him into production. With any luck, I'd run them broke and have them begging me to come back. Kill the goose that lays the golden egg, would they? There were lights on in Miles's house, and his car was at the curb. I parked in front of Miles's car, said to Pete, You'd better stay here, fellow, and protect the car. Holler halt three times fast, then shoot to kill. No! If you go inside, you'll have to stay in the bag. Blurt! Don't argue. If you want to come in, get in your bag. Pete jumped into the bag. Miles let me in. Neither of us offered to shake hands. He led me into his living room and gestured at a chair. Bell was there. I had not expected her, but I suppose it was not surprising. I looked at her and grinned. Fancy meeting you here. Don't tell me you came all the way from Mojave just to talk to little old me. Oh, I'm a gallus snapper when I get started. You should see me wear women's hats at parties. Bell frowned. Don't be funny, Dan. Say what you have to say, if anything, and get out. Don't hurry me. I think this is cozy. My former partner, my former fiancé. All we lack is my former business. Miles said placatingly, Now, Dan, don't take that attitude. We did it for your own good, and you can come back to work any time you want to. I'd be glad to have you back. For my own good, eh? Huh? That sounds like what they told the horse thief when they hanged him. As for coming back, how about it, Belle? Can I come back? She bit her lip. If Miles says so, of course. It seems like only yesterday that it used to be, if Dan says so, of course. But everything changes, that's life. And I'm not coming back, kids, you can stop fretting. I just came here tonight to find out some things. Miles glanced at Belle. She answered, Such as? Well, first, which one of you cooked up the swindle, or did you plan it together? Miles said slowly, That's an ugly word, Dan. I don't like it. Oh, come, come, let's not be mealy-mouthed. If the word is ugly, the deed is ten times as ugly. I mean faking a yellow dog contract. Faking patent assignments. That one is a federal offense, Miles. I think they pipe sunlight to you on alternate Wednesdays. I'm not sure, but no doubt the FBI can tell me. Tomorrow, I added, seeing him flinch. Dan, you're not going to be silly enough to try to make trouble about this. Trouble? I'm going to hit you in all directions, civil and criminal, on all counts. You'll be too busy to scratch unless you agree to do one thing. But I didn't mention your third peccadillo. Theft of my notes and drawings of Flexible Frank, and the working model, too. Although you may be able to make me pay for the materials for that, since I did bill them to the company. Theft! Nonsense! snapped Bell. You were working for the company! Was I? I did most of it at night. And I never was an employee, Bell, as you both know. I simply drew living expenses against profits earned by my shares. What is the Mannix outfit going to say when I file a criminal complaint, charging that the things they were interested in buying, hired girl, Willie, and Frank, never did belong to the company but were stolen from me? Nonsense, Bell repeated grimly. You were working for the company. You had a contract. I leaned back and laughed. 
Look, kids, you don't have to lie now. Save it for the witness stand. There ain't nobody here but just us chickens. What I really want to know is this. Who thought it up? I know how it was done. Bell, you used to bring in papers for me to sign. If more than one copy had to be signed, you would paperclip the other copies to the first. For my convenience, of course, you were always the perfect secretary. And all I would see of the copies underneath would be the place to sign my name. Now I know that you slipped some jokers into some of those neat piles. So I know that you were the one who conducted the mechanics of the swindle. Miles could not have done it. Shucks, Miles can't even type very well. But who worded those documents you horsed me into signing? You? I don't think so, unless you've had legal training you never mentioned. How about it, Miles? Could a mere stenographer phrase that wonderful Clause 7 so perfectly? Or did it take a lawyer? You, I mean. Miles's cigar had long since gone out. He took it from his mouth, looked at it, and said carefully, Dan, old friend, if you think you'll trap us into admissions, you're crazy. Oh, come off it. We're alone. You're both guilty either way. But I'd like to think that Delilah over there came to you with the whole thing wrapped up, complete, and then tempted you into a moment of weakness. But I know it's not true. Unless Bell is a lawyer herself, you were both in it, accomplices before and after. You wrote the double talk, she typed it, and tricked me into signing. Right? Don't answer, Miles. Of course I won't answer, Miles agreed. He may have a recorder hidden in that bag. I should have had, I agreed, but I don't. I spread the top of the bag and Pete stuck his head out. You getting it all, Pete? Careful what you say, folks. Pete has an elephant's memory. No, I didn't bring a recorder. I'm just good old lunk-headed Dan Davis who never thinks ahead. I go stumbling along trusting my friends, the way I trusted you two. Is Bell a lawyer, Dan? Or did you yourself sit down in cold blood and plan how you could hogtie me and rob me and make it look legal? Dan, interrupted Bell. With all his skill, he could make a recorder the size of a pack of cigarettes. It may not be in the bag. It may be on him. That's a good idea, Bell. Next time I'll have one. I'm aware of that, my dear, Miles answered. If he has, you are talking very loosely. Mind your tongue. Bell answered with a word I didn't know she used. My eyebrows went up. Snapping at each other? Trouble between thieves already? Miles's temper was stretching thin, I was happy to see. He answered, Mind your tongue, Dan, if you want to stay healthy. Tisk tisk. I'm younger than you are, and I've had the judo course a lot more recently. And you wouldn't shoot a man, you'd frame him with some sort of fake legal document. Thieves I said, and thieves I meant. Thieves and liars, both of you. I turned to Bell. My old man taught me never to call a lady a liar, sugar face. But you aren't a lady. You're a liar, and a thief, and a tramp. Belle turned red and gave me a look in which all her beauty vanished, and the underlying predatory animal was all that remained. Miles, she said shrilly, are you going to sit there and let him... Quiet, Miles ordered. His rudeness is calculated. It's intended to make us get excited and say things we'll regret, which you are almost doing, so keep quiet. Belle shut up, but her face was still feral. Miles turned to me. Dan, I'm a practical man always, I hope. I tried to make you see reason before you walked out of the firm. In the settlement, I tried to make it such that you would take the inevitable gracefully. Be raped quietly, you mean. As you will. I still want a peaceful settlement. You couldn't win any sort of suit, but as a lawyer I know that it is always better to stay out of court than to win, if possible. You mentioned a while ago that there was some one thing I could do that would placate you. Tell me what it is. Perhaps we can reach terms. Oh, that. I was coming to it. You can't do it, but perhaps you can arrange it. It's simple. Get Bell to assign back to me the stock I assigned to her as an engagement present. No, said Bell. Miles said, I told you to keep quiet. 
I looked at her and said, Why not, my former dear? I've taken advice on this point, as the lawyers put it, and since it was given in consideration of the fact that you promised to marry me, you are not only morally but legally bound to return it. It was not a free gift, as I believe the expression is, but something handed over for an expected and contracted consideration which I never received, to wit, your somewhat lovely self. So how about coughing up, huh? Or have you changed your mind again and are now willing to marry me? She told me where and how I could expect to marry her. Miles said tiredly, Belle, you're only making things worse. Don't you understand that he is trying to get our goats? He turned back to me. Dan, if that is what you came over for, you may as well leave. I stipulate that if the circumstances had been as you alleged, you might have a point, but they were not. You transferred that stock to Bell for value received. Huh? What value? Where's the cancelled check? There didn't need be any, for services to the company beyond her duties. I stared. What a lovely theory! Look, Miles, old boy, if it was for service to the company and not to me personally, then you must have known about it and would have been anxious to pay her the same amount. After all, we split the profits fifty-fifty even if I had, or thought I had, retained control. Don't tell me you gave Bell a block of stock of the same size. Then I saw them glance at each other and I got a wild hunch. Maybe you did. I'll bet my little dumpling made you do it or she wouldn't play. Is that right? If so, you can bet your life she registered the transfer at once, and the dates will show that I transferred stock to her at the very time we got engaged. Shucks, the engagement was in the Desert Herald. While you transferred stock to her when you put the skids under me and she jilted me. And it's all a matter of record. Maybe a judge will believe me, Miles. What do you think? I had cracked them. I had cracked them. I could tell from the way their faces went blank that I had stumbled on the one circumstance they could never explain, and one I was never meant to know. So I crowded them, and had another wild guess. Wild? No. Logical. How much stock, Bell? As much as you got out of me just for being engaged? You did more for him. You should have gotten more. I stopped suddenly. Say... I thought it was odd that Belle came all the way over here just to talk to me, seeing how she hates that trip. Maybe you didn't come all that way. Maybe you were here all along. Are you too shacked up? Or should I say, engaged? Or are you already married? I thought about it. I'll bet you are. Miles, you aren't as starry-eyed as I am. I'll bet my other shirt that you would never, never transfer stock to Bell simply on promise of marriage, but you might for a wedding present, provided you got back voting control of it. Don't bother to answer. Tomorrow I'm going to start digging for the facts. They'll be on record, too. Miles glanced at Bell and said, Don't waste your time. Meet Mrs. Gentry. So... Congratulations, both of you. You deserve each other. Now, about my stock, since Mrs. Gentry obviously can't marry me, then... Don't be silly, Dan. I've already offset your ridiculous theory. I did make a stock transfer to Bell just as you did, for the same reason, services to the firm. As you say, these things are matters of record. Bell and I were married just a week ago but you will find the stock registered to her quite some time ago if you care to look it up. You can't connect them. No, she received stock from both of us because of her great value to the firm. Then after you jilted her and after you left the employ of the firm, we were married. It set me back. Miles was too smart to tell a lie I could check on so easily. But there was something about it that was not true, something more than I had as yet found out. When and where were you married? Santa Barbara Courthouse, last Thursday. Not that it is your business. Perhaps not. When was the stock transfer? I don't know exactly. Look it up if you want to know. Damn it! 
It just did not ring true that he had handed stock over to Bell before he had her committed to him. That was the sort of sloppy stunt I pulled. It wasn't in character for him. I'm wondering something, Miles. If I put a detective to work on it, might I find that the two of you got married once before a little earlier than that? Maybe in Yuma? Or Las Vegas? Or maybe you ducked over to Reno that time you both went north for the tax hearings? Maybe it would turn out that there was such a marriage record, and maybe the date of the stock transfer and the dates my patents were assigned to the firm all made a pretty pattern, huh? Miles did not crack. He did not even look at Bell. As for Bell, the hate in her face could not have been increased even by a lucky stab in the dark. Yet it seemed to fit, and I decided to ride the hunch to the limit. Miles simply said, Dan, I have been patient with you and have tried to be conciliatory. All it's got me is abuse. So I think it's time you left, or I'll bloody well make a stab at throwing you out, you and your flea-bitten cat. Olay, I answered. That's the first manly thing you've said tonight. But don't call Pete flea-bitten. He understands English, and he is likely to take a chunk out of you. Okay, ex-pal, I'll get out. But I want to make a short curtain speech, very short. It's probably the last word I'll ever have to say to you, okay? Well, okay, make it short. Bell said urgently, Miles, I want to talk to you. He motioned her to be quiet without looking at her. Go ahead. Be brief. I turned to Bell. You probably won't want to hear this, Bell. I suggest that you leave. She stayed, of course. I wanted to be sure she would. I looked back at him. Miles, I'm not too angry with you. The things a man will do for a larcenous woman are beyond belief. If Samson and Mark Antony were vulnerable, why should I expect you to be immune? By rights, instead of being angry, I should be grateful to you. I guess I am a little. I do know I'm sorry for you. I looked over at Bell. You've got her now, and she's all your problem, and all it has cost me is a little money and temporarily my peace of mind. But what will she cost you? She cheated me. She even managed to persuade you, my trusted friend, to cheat me. What day will she team up with a new cat's paw and start cheating you? Next week? Next month? As long as next year? As surely as a dog returns to its vomit. Miles! Bell shrilled. Miles said dangerously, Get out! And I knew he meant it. So I stood up. We were just going. I'm sorry for you, old fellow. Both of us made just one mistake originally, and it was as much my fault as yours. But you've got to pay for it alone. And that's too bad, because it was such an innocent mistake. His curiosity got him. What do you mean? We should have wondered why a woman so smart and beautiful and competent and all-around high-powered was willing to come to work for us at clerk typist's wages. If we had taken her fingerprints the way the big firms do and run a routine check, we might not have hired her, and you and I would still be partners. Pay dirt again. Miles looked suddenly at his wife, and she looked, well, cornered rat is wrong. Rats aren't shaped like Bell. And I couldn't leave well enough alone. I just had to pick at it. I walked toward her, saying, Well, Bell, if I took that highball glass sitting beside you and had the fingerprints checked, what would I find? Pictures in post offices? The big con? Or bigamy? Marrying suckers for their money, maybe? Is Miles legally your husband? I reached down and picked up the glass. Bell slapped it out of my hand, and Miles shouted at me. And I had finally pushed my luck too far. I had been stupid to go into a cage of dangerous animals with no weapon. Then I forgot the first tenet of the animal tamer. I turned my back. Miles shouted and I turned toward him. Bell reached for her purse, and I remember thinking that it was a hell of a time for her to be reaching for a cigarette. Then I felt the stab of the needle. I remember feeling just one thing as my knees got weak and I started slipping toward the carpet. Utter astonishment that Bell would do such a thing to me. When it came right down to it, 
I still trusted her. 4. I never was completely unconscious. I got dizzy and vague as the drug hit me. It hits even quicker than morphine. But that was all. Miles yelled something at Bell and grabbed me around the chest as my knees folded. As he dragged me over and let me collapse into a chair, even the dizziness passed. But while I was awake, part of me was dead. I know now what they used on me. The zombie drug. Uncle Sam's answer to brainwashing. So far as I know, we never used it on a prisoner, but the boys whipped it up in the investigation of brainwashing, and there it was. Illegal, but very effective. It's the same stuff they now use in one-day psychoanalysis, but I believe it takes a court order to permit even a psychiatrist to use it. God knows where Bell laid hands on it, but then God alone knows what other suckers she had on the string. But I wasn't wondering about that then. I wasn't wondering about anything. I just lay slumped there, passive as a vegetable, hearing what went on, seeing anything in front of my eyes. But if Lady Godiva had strolled through without her horse, I would not have shifted my eyes as she passed out of my vision, unless I was told to. Pete jumped out of his bag, trotted over to where I slouched, and asked what was wrong. When I didn't answer, he started stropping my shins vigorously back and forth, while still demanding an explanation. When still I did not respond, he levitated to my knees, put his forepaws on my chest, looked me right in the face, and demanded to know what was wrong, right now, and no nonsense. I didn't answer, and he began to wail. That caused Miles and Bell to pay attention to him. Once Miles had me in the chair, he had turned to Bell and had said bitterly, Now you've done it? Have you gone crazy? Bell answered, Keep your nerve, chubby. We're going to settle him once and for all. What? If you think I'm going to help in a murder, stuff it. That would be the logical thing to do, but you don't have the guts for it. Fortunately, it's not necessary with that stuff in him. What do you mean? He's our boy now. He'll do what I tell him to. He won't make any more trouble. But, God, Bell, you can't keep him doped up forever. Once he comes out of it... Quit talking like a lawyer. I know what this stuff will do. You don't. When he comes out of it, he'll do whatever I've told him to do. I'll tell him never to sue us. He'll never sue us. I tell him to quit sticking his nose into our business. Okay, he'll leave us alone. I tell him to go to Timbuktu. He'll go there. I tell him to forget all this. He'll forget. But he'll do it just the same. I listened, understanding her, but not in the least interested. If somebody had shouted, The house is on fire, I would have understood that, too, and I still would not have been interested. I don't believe it. You don't, huh? She looked at him oddly. You ought to. Huh? What do you mean? Skip it. Skip it. This stuff works, Chubby. But first we've got to... It was then that Pete started wailing. You don't hear a cat wail very often. You could go a lifetime and not hear it. They don't do it when fighting, no matter how badly they are hurt. They never do it out of simple displeasure. A cat does it only in ultimate distress. When the situation is utterly unbearable but beyond its capacity, and there is nothing left to do but keen, it puts one in mind of a banshee. Also, it is hardly to be endured. It hits a nerve-wracking frequency. Miles turned and said, That confounded cat! We've got to get it out of here! Bell said, Kill it. Huh? You're always too drastic, Bell. Why, Dan would raise more cane about that worthless animal than he would if we had stripped him completely. Here! He turned and picked up Pete's travel bag. I'll kill it, Bell said savagely. I've wanted to kill that damned cat for months. She looked around for a weapon and found one, a poker from the fireplace set. She ran over and grabbed it. Miles picked up Pete and tried to put him into the bag. Tried is the word. Pete isn't anxious to be picked up by anyone but me or Ricky, and even I would not pick him up while he was wailing, without very careful negotiation. An emotionally disturbed cat is as touchy as mercury fulminate. But even if he were not upset, 
Pete certainly would never permit himself without protest to be picked up by the scruff of the neck. Pete got him with claws in the forearm and teeth in the fleshy part of Miles' left thumb. Miles yelped and dropped him. Bell shrilled, Stand clear, chubby! and swung at him with the poker. Bell's intentions were sufficiently forthright, and she had the strength and the weapon. But she wasn't skilled with her weapon, whereas Pete is very skilled with his. He ducked under that roundhouse swipe and hit her four ways, two paws for each of her legs. Bell screamed and dropped the poker. I didn't see much of the rest of it. I was still looking straight ahead and could see most of the living room, but I couldn't see anything outside that angle, because no one told me to look in any other direction. So I followed the rest of it mostly by sound, except once when they doubled back across my cone of vision, two people chasing a cat. Then, with unbelievable suddenness, two people being chased by a cat. Aside from that one short scene, I was aware of the battle by the sounds of crashes, running, shouts, curses, and screams. But I don't think they ever laid a glove on him. The worst thing that happened to me that night was that in Pete's finest hour, his greatest battle and greatest victory, I not only did not see all the details, but I was totally unable to appreciate any of it. I saw and I heard, but I had no feeling about it. At his supreme moment of truth, I was numb. I recall it now and conjure up emotion I could not feel then, but it's not the same thing. I'm forever deprived, like a narcolept on a honeymoon. The crashes and curses ceased abruptly, and shortly Miles and Bell came back into the living room. Bell said between gasps, Who left that censorable screen door unhooked? You did. Shut up about it. It's gone now. Miles had blood on his face as well as his hands. He dabbed at the fresh scratches on his face and did them no good. At some point he must have tripped and gone down, for his clothes looked it, and his coat was split up the back. I will like hell shut up. Have you got a gun in the house? Huh? I'm going to shoot that damned cat. Bell was in even worse shape than Miles. She had more skin where Pete could get at it. Legs, bare arms, and shoulders. It was clear that she would not be wearing strapless dresses again soon, and unless she got expert attention promptly, she was likely to have scars. She looked like a harpy after a no-holds-barred row with her sisters. Miles said, Sit down. She answered him briefly and, by implication, negatively. I'm going to kill that cat. Then don't sit down. Go wash yourself. I'll help you with iodine and stuff, and you can help me. But forget that cat. We're well rid of it. Bell answered rather incoherently, but Miles understood her. You too, he answered, in spades. Look here, Bell. If I did have a gun, I'm not saying that I have, and you went out there and started shooting, whether you got the cat or not, you would have the police here inside of ten minutes, snooping around and asking questions. Do you want that? with him on our hands? He jerked a thumb in my direction. And if you go outside the house tonight without a gun, that beast will probably kill you. He scowled even more deeply. There ought to be a law against keeping an animal like that. He's a public danger. Listen to him. We could all hear Pete prowling around the house. He was not wailing now. He was voicing his war cry, inviting them to choose weapons and come outside, singly or in bunches. Bell listened to it and shuddered. Miles said, Don't worry, he can't get in. I not only hooked the screen you left open, I locked the door. I did not leave it open. Have it your own way. Miles went around checking the window fastenings. Presently Bell left the room and so did he. Sometime while they were gone, Pete shut up. I don't know how long they were gone. Time didn't mean anything to me. Bell came back first. Her makeup and hairdo were perfect. She had put on a long-sleeved, high-necked dress and had replaced the ruined stockings. Except for band-aid strips on her face, the results of battle did not show. Had it not been for the grim look on her fizz, I would have considered her, under other circumstances, a delectable sight. 
She came straight toward me and told me to stand up, so I did. She went through me quickly and expertly, not forgetting watch pocket, shirt pockets, and the diagonal one on the left inside of the jacket, which most suits do not have. The take was not much. My wallet with a small amount of cash, ID cards, driver's license, and such, keys, small change, a nasal inhaler against the smog, minor miscellaneous junk, and the envelope containing the certified check which she herself had bought and had sent to me. She turned it over, read the closed endorsement I had made on it, and looked puzzled. What's this, Dan? Buying a slug of insurance? No. I would have told her the rest, but answering the last question asked of me was the best I could do. She frowned and put it with the rest of the contents of my pockets. Then she caught sight of Pete's bag and apparently recalled the flap in it I used for a briefcase, for she picked it up and opened the flap. At once she found the quadruplicate sets of the dozen and a half forms I had signed for Mutual Assurance Company. She sat down and started to read them. I stood where she had left me, a tailor's dummy waiting to be put away. Presently Miles came in wearing bathrobe and slippers and quite a large amount of gauze and adhesive tape. He looked like a fourth-rate middleweight whose manager had let him be outmatched. He was wearing one bandage like a scalp lock, fore and aft, on his bald head. Pete must have got to him while he was down. Bell glanced up, waved him to silence, and indicated the stack of papers she was through with. He sat down and started to read. He caught up with her and finished the last one reading over her shoulder. She said, This puts a different complexion on things. An understatement. This commitment order is for December 4th. That's tomorrow. Bell, he's as hot as noon in Mojave. We've got to get him out of here. He glanced at a clock. They'll be looking for him in the morning. Miles, you always get chicken when the pressure is on. This is a break, maybe the best break we could hope for. How do you figure? This zombie soup, good as it is, has one shortcoming. Suppose you dose somebody with it and load him up with what you want him to do. Okay, so he does it. He carries out your orders. He has to. Know anything about hypnosis? Not much. Do you know anything but law, Chubby? You haven't any curiosity. A post-hypnotic command, which is what this amounts to, may conflict, in fact, it's almost certain to conflict, with what the subject really wants to do. Eventually, that may land him in the hands of a psychiatrist. If the psychiatrist is any good, he's likely to find out what the trouble is. It is just possible that Dan here might go to one and get unstuck from whatever orders I give him. If he did, he could make plenty of trouble. Damn it, you told me this drug was sure fire. Good God, Chubby, you have to take chances with everything in life. That's what makes it fun. Let me think. After a bit, she said, The simplest thing and the safest is to let him go ahead with this sleep jump he is all set to take. He wouldn't be any more out of our hair if he was dead, and we don't have to take any risk. Instead of having to give him a bunch of complicated orders and then praying that he won't come unstuck, all we have to do is order him to go ahead with the cold sleep, then sober him up and get him out of here, or get him out of here and then sober him. She turned to me. Dan, when are you going to take the sleep? I'm not. Huh? What's all this? She gestured at the papers from my bag. Papers for cold sleep. Contracts with mutual assurance. He's nutty. Miles commented. Hmm, of course he is. I keep forgetting that they can't really think when they're under it. They can hear and talk and answer questions, but it has to be just the right questions. They can't think. She came up close and looked me in the eyes. Dan, I want you to tell me all about this cold sleep deal. Start at the beginning and tell it all the way through. You've got all the papers here to do it. Apparently you signed them just today. Now you say you aren't going to do it. Tell me all about it because I want to know why you were going to do it, and now you say you aren't. So I told her. Put that way, I could answer. 
It took a long time to tell, as I did just what she said and told it all the way through in detail. So you sat there in that drive-in and decided not to? You decided to come out here and make trouble for us instead? Yes. I was about to go on, tell about the trip out, tell her what I had said to Pete and what he had said to me, tell her how I had stopped at a drug store and taken care of my hired girl stock, how I had driven to Miles's house, how Pete had not wanted to wait in the car, how... But she did not give me a chance. She said, You've changed your mind again, Dan. You want to take the cold sleep. You're going to take the cold sleep. You won't let anything in the world stand in the way of your taking the cold sleep. Understand me? What are you going to do? I'm going to take the cold sleep. I want to take... I started to sway. I had been standing like a flagpole for more than an hour, I would guess, without moving any muscle, because no one had told me to. I started collapsing slowly toward her. She jumped back and said sharply, Sit down. So I sat down. Bell turned to Miles. That does it. I'll hammer away at it until I'm sure he can't miss. Miles looked at the clock. He said that doctor wanted him there at noon. Plenty of time. But we had better drive him there ourselves just to be... No, damn it. What's the trouble? The time is too short. I gave him enough soup for a horse because I wanted it to hit him fast, before he hit me. By noon he'd be sober enough to convince most people, but not a doctor. Maybe it'll just be perfunctory. His physical examination is already here and signed. You heard what he said the doctor told him. The doctor's going to check him to see if he's had anything to drink. That means he'll test his reflexes and take his reaction time and peer in his eyes and, oh, all the things we don't want done. The things we don't dare let a doctor do. Miles, it won't work. How about the next day? Call him up and tell him there's been a slight delay. Shut up and let me think. Presently she started looking over the papers I had brought with me. Then she left the room, returned immediately with a jeweler's loop, which she screwed into her right eye like a monocle, and proceeded to examine each paper with great care. Miles asked her what she was doing, but she brushed his question aside. Presently she took the loop out of her eye and said, Thank goodness they all have to use the same government forms. Chubby, get me the Yellow Pages phone book. What for? Get it, get it! I want to check the exact phrasing of a firm name. Oh, I know what it is, but I want to be sure. Grumbling, Miles fetched it. She thumbed through it, then said, Yes, Master Insurance Company of California. And there's room enough on each of them. I wish it could be Motors instead of Masters. That would be a cinch. But I don't have any connection at Motors Insurance, and besides, I'm not sure they even handle hibernation. I think they're just autos and trucks. She looked up. Chubby, you're going to have to drive me out to the plant right away. Huh? Unless you know of some quicker way to get an electric typewriter with executive typeface and carbon ribbon. No, you go out by yourself and fetch it back. I've got telephoning to do. He frowned. I'm beginning to see what you plan to do. But, Bell, this is crazy. This is fantastically dangerous. She laughed. That's what you think. I told you I had good connections before we ever teamed up. Could you have swung the Mannix deal alone? Well, I don't know. I know. And maybe you don't know that Master Insurance is part of the Mannix group. Well, no, I didn't. And I don't see what difference it makes. It means my connections are still good. See here, Chubby. The firm I used to work for used to help Mannix Enterprises with their tax losses, until my boss left the country. How do you think we got such a good deal without being able to guarantee that Danny Boy went with the deal? I know all about Mannix. Now hurry up and get that typewriter and I'll let you watch an artist at work. Watch out for that cat. Miles grumbled but started to leave, then returned. Bell, didn't Dan park right in front of the house? Why? His car isn't there now. He looked worried. 
Well, he probably parked around the corner. It's unimportant. Go get that typewriter. Hurry. He left again. I could have told them where I had parked, but since they did not ask me, I did not think about it. I did not think at all. Bell went elsewhere in the house and left me alone. Sometime around daylight, Miles got back, looking haggard and carrying our heavy typewriter. Then I was left alone again. Once Bell came back in and said, Dan, you've got a paper there telling the insurance company to take care of your hired girl stock. You don't want to do that. You want to give it to me. I didn't answer. She looked annoyed and said, Let's put it this way. You do want to give it to me. You know you want to give it to me. You know that, don't you? Yes. I want to give it to you. Good. You want to give it to me. You have to give it to me. You won't be happy until you give it to me. Now where is it? Is it in your car? No. Then where is it? I mailed it. What? She grew shrill. When did you mail it? Who did you mail it to? Why did you do it? If she had asked the second question last, I would have answered it. But I answered the last question, that being all I could handle. I assigned it. Miles came in. Where did he put it? He says he's mailed it, because he has assigned it. You had better find his car and search it. He may just think he actually mailed it. He certainly had it with him at the insurance company. Assigned it, repeated Miles. Good Lord, to whom? I'll ask him. Dan? To whom did you assign your stock? To the Bank of America. She didn't ask me why, or I would have told her about Ricky. All she did was slump her shoulders and sigh. There goes the ball game, Chubby. We can forget about the stock. It'll take more than a nail file to get it away from a bank. She straightened up suddenly. Unless he hasn't really mailed it yet. If he hasn't, I'll clean that assignment off the back so pretty you'll think it's been to the laundry. Then he'll assign it again. To me. To us, corrected Miles. That's just a detail. Go find his car. Miles returned later and announced, It's not anywhere within six blocks of here. I cruised around all the streets and the alleys, too. He must have used a cab. You heard him say he drove his own car. Well, it's not out there. Ask him when and where he mailed the stock. So Bell did, and I told them. Just before I came here, I mailed it at the post box at the corner of Sepulveda and Ventura Boulevard. Do you suppose he's lying? asked Miles. He can't lie, not in the shape he's in, and he's too definite about it to be mixed up. Forget it, Miles. Maybe after he's put away it will turn out that his assignment is no good because he had already sold it to us. At least I'll get his signature on some blank sheets and be ready to try it. She did try to get my signature, and I tried to oblige, but in the shape I was in I could not write well enough to satisfy her. Finally she snatched a sheet out of my hand and said viciously, You make me sick. I can sign your name better than that. Then she leaned over me and said tensely, I wish I had killed your cat. They did not bother me again until later in the day. Then Bell came in and said, Danny boy, I'm going to give you a hypo, and then you'll feel a lot better. You'll feel able to get up and move around and act just like you always have acted. You won't be angry at anybody, especially not at Miles and me. We're your best friends. We are, aren't we? Who are your best friends? You are. You and Miles. But I'm more than that. I'm your sister. Say it. You're my sister. Good. Now we're going for a ride, and then you are going for a long sleep. You've been sick, and when you wake up, you'll be well. Understand me? Yes. Who am I? You're my best friend. You're my sister. Good boy. Push your sleeve back. I didn't feel the hypo go in, but it stung after she pulled it out. I sat up and shrugged and said, 
Gee, sis, that stung. What was it? Something to make you feel better. You've been sick. Yeah, I'm sick. Where's Miles? He'll be here in a moment. Now let's have your other arm. Push back the sleeve. I said, What for? But I pushed back the sleeve and let her shoot me again. I jumped. She smiled. That didn't really hurt, did it? Huh? No, it didn't hurt. What's it for? It will make you sleepy on the ride. Then when we get there, you'll wake up. Okay. I'd like to sleep. I want to take a long sleep. Then I felt puzzled and looked around. Where's Pete? Pete was going to sleep with me. Pete? Belle said. Why, dear, don't you remember? You sent Pete to stay with Ricky. She's going to take care of him. Oh, yes. I grinned with relief. I had sent Pete to Ricky. I remembered mailing him. That was good. Ricky loved Pete, and she would take good care of him while I was asleep. They drove me out to the consolidated sanctuary at Sawtell, one that many of the smaller insurance companies used, those that didn't have their own. I slept all the way, but came awake at once when Bell spoke to me. Miles stayed in his car, and she took me in. The girl at the desk looked up and said, Davis? Yes, agreed Bell. I'm his sister. Is the representative for Master Insurance here? You'll find him down in treatment room nine. They're ready and waiting. You can give the papers to the man from Master. She looked at me with interest. He's had his physical examination. Oh, yes, Bell assured her. Brother is a therapy delay case, you know. He's under an opiate for the pain. The receptionist clucked sympathetically. Well, hurry on in, then. Through that door and turn left. In room nine there was a man in street clothes and one in white coveralls and a woman in a nurse's uniform. They helped me get undressed and treated me like an idiot child while Bell explained again that I was under a sedative for the pain. Once he had me stripped and up on the table, the man in white massaged my belly, digging his fingers in deeply. No trouble with this one, he announced. He's empty. He hasn't had anything to eat or drink since yesterday evening, agreed Bell. That's fine. Sometimes they come in here stuffed like a Christmas turkey. Some people have no sense. True, very true. Uh-huh. Okay, son, clench your fist tight while I get this needle in. I did, and things began to get really hazy. Suddenly I remembered something and tried to sit up. Where's Pete? I want to see Pete. Bell took my head and kissed me. There, there, buddy. Pete couldn't come, remember? Pete had to stay with Ricky. I quieted down, and she said gently to the others, Our brother Peter has a sick little girl at home. I dropped off to sleep. Presently I felt very cold, but I couldn't move to reach the covers. 5. I was complaining to the bartender about the air conditioning. It was turned too high, and we were all going to catch cold. No matter, he assured me. You won't feel it when you're asleep. Sleep, sleep, soup of the evening, beautiful sleep. He had Bell's face. How about a warm drink, then? I wanted to know. A Tom and Jerry? Or a hot buttered bum? You're a bum, the doctor answered. Sleeping's too good for him. Throw the bum out. I tried to hook my feet around the brass rail to stop them, but this bar had no brass rail, which seemed funny and I was flat on my back, which seemed funnier still, unless they had installed bedside service for people with no feet. I didn't have feet, so how could I hook them under a brass rail? No hands, either. Look, Ma, no hands! Pete sat on my chest and wailed. I was back in basic training. Advanced basic, it must have been, for I was at Camp Hale, at one of those silly exercises where they throw snow down your neck to make a man of you. I was having to climb the damnedest, biggest mountain in all Colorado, and it was all ice, and I had no feet. Nevertheless, I was carrying the biggest pack anybody ever saw. 
I remembered that they were trying to find out if GIs could be used instead of pack mules, and I had been picked because I was expendable. I wouldn't have made it at all if little Ricky hadn't got behind me and pushed. The top sergeant turned, and he had a face just like Bell's, and he was livid with rage. Come on, you! I can't afford to wait for you! I don't care whether you make it or not, but you can't sleep until you get there! My no feet wouldn't take me any farther, and I fell down in the snow, and it was icy warm, and I did fall asleep while little Ricky wailed and begged me not to. But I had to sleep. I woke up in bed with Belle. She was shaking me and saying, Wake up, Dan. I can't wait thirty years for you. A girl has to think of her future. I tried to get up and hand her the bags of gold I had under the bed, but she was gone. And anyhow, a hired girl with her face had picked all the gold up and put it in its tray on top and scurried out of the room. I tried to run after it, but I had no feet, no body at all, I discovered. I ain't got no body, and nobody cares for me. The world consisted of top sergeants and work, so what difference did it make where you worked or how? I let them put the harness back on me, and I went back to climbing that icy mountain. It was all white and beautifully rounded, and if I could just climb to the rosy tip, they would let me sleep, which was what I needed. But I never made it. No hands, no feet, no nothing. There was a forest fire on the mountain. The snow did not melt, but I could feel the heat in waves beating against me while I kept on struggling. The top sergeant was leaning over me and saying, Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! He no more than got me awake before he wanted me to sleep again. I'm vague about what happened then for a while. Part of the time I was on a table which vibrated under me, and there were lights and snaky-looking equipment and lots of people. But when I was fully awake I was in a hospital bed, and I felt all right except for that listless, half-floating feeling you have after a Turkish bath. I had hands and feet again. But nobody would talk to me, and every time I tried to ask a question a nurse would pop something into my mouth. I was massaged quite a lot. Then one morning I felt fine and got out of bed as soon as I woke up. I felt a little dizzy, but that was all. I knew who I was, I knew how I had got there, and I knew that all that other stuff had been dreams. I knew who had put me there. If Belle had given me orders while I was drugged to forget her shenanigans, either the orders had not taken or thirty years of cold sleep had washed out the hypnotic effect. I was blurry about some details, but I knew how they had shanghaied me. I wasn't especially angry about it. True, it had happened just yesterday, since yesterday is the day just one sleep behind you, but the sleep had been thirty years long. The feeling cannot be precisely defined, since it is entirely subjective, but while my memory was sharp for the events of yesterday, nevertheless my feelings about those events were to things far away. You have seen double images in television of a pitcher making his wind-up, while his picture sits as a ghost on top of a long shot of the whole baseball diamond? Something like that. My conscious recollection was a close-up. My emotional reaction was to something long ago and far away. I fully intended to look up Bell and Miles and chop them into cat meat, but there was no hurry. Next year would do. Right now I was eager to have a look at the year 2000. But speaking of cat meat, where was Pete? He ought to be around somewhere, unless the poor little beggar hadn't lived through the sleep. Then, and not until then, did I remember that my careful plans to bring Pete along had been wrecked. I took Bell and Miles out of the hold basket and moved them over to Urgent. Try to kill my cat, would they? They had done worse than kill Pete. They had turned him out to go wild to wear out his days wandering back alleys in search of scraps, while his ribs grew thin and his sweet pixie nature warped into distrust of all two-legged beasts. They had let him die, for he was surely dead by now, let him die thinking that I had deserted him. For this they would pay, if they were still alive. Oh, how I hoped they were still alive! 
unspeakable. I found that I was standing by the foot of my bed, grasping the rail to steady myself, and dressed only in pajamas. I looked around for some way to call someone. Hospital rooms had not changed much. There was no window, and I could not see where the light came from. The bed was high and narrow, as hospital beds had always been in my recollection, but it showed signs of having been engineered into something more than a place to sleep. Among other things, it seemed to have some sort of plumbing under it, which I suspected was a mechanized bedpan, and the side table was part of the bed structure itself. But while I ordinarily would have been intensely interested in such gadgetry, right now I simply wanted to find the pear-shaped switch which summons the nurse. I wanted my clothes. It was missing, but I found what it had been transformed into a pressure switch on the side of the table that was not quite a table. My hand struck it in trying to find it, and the transparency opposite where my head would have been had I been in bed shone out with service call. Almost immediately it blinked out and was replaced with one moment, please. Very quickly the door silently rolled aside and a nurse came in. Nurses had not changed much. This one was reasonably cute had the familiar firm manners of a drill sergeant, wore a perky little white hat perched on short orchid color hair, and was dressed in a white uniform. It was strangely cut and covered her here and uncovered her there in a fashion different from 1970. But women's clothes, even work uniforms, were always doing that. She would still have been a nurse in any year, just by her unmistakable manner. You get back in that bed. Where are my clothes? Get back in that bed, now! I answered reasonably. Look, nurse, I'm a free citizen, over twenty-one and not a criminal. I don't have to get back into that bed, and I'm not going to. Now, are you going to show me where my clothes are, or shall I go out the way I am and start looking? She looked at me, then turned suddenly and went out. The door ducked out of her way. But it would not duck out of my way. I was still trying to study out the gimmick, being fairly sure that if one engineer could dream it up, another could figure it out, when it opened again and a man came in. "'Good morning,' he said. "'I'm Dr. Albrecht.' His clothes looked like a cross between a Harlem Sunday and a picnic to me, but his brisk manner and his tired eyes were convincingly professional. I believed him. "'Good morning, doctor. I'd like to have my clothes.' He stepped just far enough inside to let the door slide into place behind him, then reached inside his clothes and pulled out a pack of cigarettes. He got one out, waved it briskly in the air, placed it in his mouth, and puffed on it. It was lighted. He offered me the pack. Have one? Uh, no, thanks. Go ahead. It won't hurt you. I shook my head. I had always worked with a cigarette smoldering beside me. The progress of a job could be judged by the overflowing ashtrays and the burns on the drafting board. Now I felt a little faint at the sight of smoke, and wondered if I had dropped the nicotine habit somewhere in the slept-away years. Thanks, just the same. Okay. Mr. Davis, I've been here six years. I'm a specialist in hypnology, resuscitation, and like subjects. Here and elsewhere I've helped 8,073 patients make the comeback from hypothermia to normal life. You're number 8,074. I've seen them do all sorts of odd things when they came out. Odd to laymen, not to me. Some of them want to go right back to sleep again and scream at me when I try to keep them awake. Some of them do go back to sleep and we have to ship them off to another sort of institution. Some of them start weeping endlessly when they realize that it is a one-way ticket and it's too late to go home to whatever year they started from. And some of them, like you, demand their clothes and want to run out into the street. Well, why not? Am I a prisoner? No. You can have your clothes. I imagine you'll find them out of style, but that is your problem. However, while I send for them, would you mind telling me what it is that is so terribly urgent that you must attend to it right this minute, after it has waited thirty years? That's how long you've been at sub-temperature, thirty years. Is it really urgent? Or would later today do as well? 
or even tomorrow. I started to blurt out that it damn well was urgent, then stopped and looked sheepish. Maybe not that urgent. Then, as a favor to me, will you get back into bed, let me check you over, have your breakfast, and perhaps talk with me before you go galloping off in all directions? I might even be able to tell you which way to gallop. Uh, okay, doctor. Sorry to have caused trouble. I climbed into bed. It felt good. I was suddenly tired and shaky. No trouble. You should see some that we get. We have to pull them down off the ceiling. He straightened the covers around my shoulders, then leaned over the table built into the bed. Dr. Albrecht in 17, send a room orderly with breakfast. Um, menu four minus. He turned to me and said, roll over and pull up your jacket. I want to get at your ribs. While I'm checking you, you can ask questions, if you want to. I tried to think while he prodded my ribs. I suppose it was a stethoscope he used, although it looked like a miniaturized hearing aid. But they had not improved one thing about it. The pickup he pushed against me was as cold and hard as ever. What do you ask after thirty years? Have they reached the stars yet? Who's cooking up the war to end war this time? Do babies come out of test tubes? Doc, do they still have popcorn machines in the lobbies of movie theaters? They did the last time I looked. I don't get much time for such things. By the way, the word is grabby now, not movie. So? Why? Try one. You'll find out. But be sure to fasten your seatbelt. They know the whole theater on some shots. See here, Mr. Davis, we're faced with the same problem every day, and we've got it down to routine. We've got adjustment vocabularies for each entrance year, and historical and cultural summaries. It's quite necessary, for malorientation can be extreme, no matter how much we lack weight the shock. Ah, uh, I suppose so. Decidedly, especially in an extreme lapse like yours. Thirty years. Is thirty years the maximum? Yes and no. Thirty-five years is the very longest we've had experience with since the first commercial client was placed in sub-temperature in December 1965. You are the longest sleeper I have revived. But we have clients in here now with contract times up to a century and a half. They should never have accepted you for as long as thirty years. They didn't know enough then. They were taking a great chance with your life. You were lucky. Really? Really? Turn over. He went on examining me and added, But with what we've learned now, I'd be willing to prepare a man for a thousand-year jump if there were any way to finance it. Hold him at the temperature you were at for a year just to check, then crash him to minus two hundred in a millisecond. He'd live, I think. Let's try your reflexes. That crash business didn't sound good to me. Dr. Albrecht went on, Sit up and cross your knees. You won't find the language problem difficult. Of course, I've been careful to talk in 1970 vocabulary. I rather pride myself on being able to talk selectively in the entrance speech of any of my patients. I've made a hypno-study of it. But you'll be speaking contemporary idiom perfectly in a week. It's really just added vocabulary. I thought of telling him that at least four times he had used words not used in 1970, or at least not that way, but I decided it wouldn't be polite. That's all for now, he said presently. By the way, Mrs. Schultz has been trying to reach you. Huh? Don't you know her? She insisted that she was an old friend of yours. Schultz, I repeated. I suppose I've known several Mrs. Schultzes at one time or another, but the only one I can place was my fourth grade teacher. But she'd be dead by now. Maybe she took the sleep. Well, you can accept the message when you feel like it. I'm going to sign a release on you. But if you're smart, you'll stay in here for a few days and soak up reorientation. I'll look in on you later. So, twenty-three skidoo, as they used to say in your day. Here comes the orderly with your breakfast. I decided that he was a better doctor than a linguist. But I stopped thinking about it when I saw the orderly. 
It rolled in, carefully avoiding Dr. Albrecht, who walked straight out, paying no attention to it and making no effort himself to avoid it. It came over, adjusted the built-in bed table, swung it over me, opened it, and arranged my breakfast on it. Shall I pour your coffee? Yes, please. I did not really want it poured, as I would rather have it stay hot until I finished everything else, but I wanted to see it poured. For I was in a delighted daze. It was flexible frank. Not the jack-leg, bread-boarded, jury-rigged first model Miles and Bell had stolen from me, of course not. This one resembled the first Frank the way a turbo speedster resembles the first horseless carriage. But a man knows his own work. I had set the basic pattern and this was the necessary evolution. Frank's great-grandson. Improved, slicked up, made more efficient, but the same bloodline. Will that be all? Wait a minute. Apparently I had said the wrong thing, for the automaton reached inside itself and pulled out a stiff plastic sheet and handed it to me. The sheet remained fastened to him by a slim steel chain. I looked at it and found printed on it, Voice Code, Eager Beaver Model 17A, Important Notice. This service automaton does not understand human speech. It has no understanding at all being merely a machine. But for your convenience, it has been designed to respond to a list of spoken orders. It will ignore anything else said in its presence. Or, if any phrase triggers it incompletely or such that a circuit dilemma is created, it will offer this instruction sheet. Please read it carefully. Thank you. Aladdin Auto Engineering Corporation, manufacturers of Eager Beaver, Willy Waugh, Drafting Dan, Builder Bill, Green Thumb, and Nanny. Custom designers and consultants in automation problems. At your service. The motto appeared on their trademark showing Aladdin rubbing his lamp and a genie appearing. Below this was a long list of simple orders. Stop. Go. Yes. No. Slower. Faster. Come here. Fetch a nurse. Etc. Then there was a shorter list of tasks common in hospitals, such as back rubs, and including some that I had never heard of. The list closed abruptly with the statement, Routines 87 through 242 may be ordered only by hospital staff members, and the order phrases are therefore not listed here. I had not voice-coded the first flexible Frank. You had to punch buttons on his control board. It was not because I had not thought of it, but because the analyzer and telephone exchange for the purpose would have weighed and bulked and cost more than all the rest of Frank Sr. net. I decided that I would have to learn some new wrinkles in miniaturization and simplification before I would be ready to practice engineering here. But I was anxious to get started on it, as I could see from Eager Beaver that it was going to be more fun than ever, lots of new possibilities. Engineering is the art of the practical and depends more on the total state of the art than it does on the individual engineer. When railroading time comes, you can railroad, but not before. Look at poor Professor Langley breaking his heart on a flying machine that should have flown. He had put the necessary genius in it, but he was just a few years too early to enjoy the benefit of collateral art he needed and did not have. Or take the great Leonardo da Vinci, so far out of his time that his most brilliant concepts were utterly unbuildable. I was going to have fun here. I mean, now. I handed back the instruction card, then got out of bed and looked for the data plate. I had halfway expected to see Hired Girl Inc. at the bottom of the notice, and I wondered if Aladdin was a daughter corporation of the Mannix Group. The data plate did not tell me much other than model, serial number, factory, and such, but it did list the patents, about 40 of them, and the earliest I was very interested to see was in 1970, almost certainly based on my original model and drawings. I found a pencil and memo pad on the table and jotted down the number of that first patent, but my interest was purely intellectual. Even if it had been stolen from me, I was sure it had been, it had expired in 1987 unless they had changed the patent laws, and only those granted later than 1983 would still be valid. 
but I wanted to know. A light glowed on the automaton, and he announced, I am being called. May I leave? Huh? Sure, run along. It started to reach for the phrase list. I hastily said, Go. Thank you. Goodbye. It detoured around me. Thank you. You are welcome. Whoever had dictated the gadget's sound responses had a very pleasant baritone voice. I got back into bed and ate the breakfast I had let get cold, only it turned out not to be cold. Breakfast four minus was about enough for a medium-sized bird, but I found that it was enough, even though I had been very hungry. I suppose my stomach had shrunk. It wasn't until I had finished that I remembered that this was the first food I had eaten in a generation. I noticed it then because they had included a menu. What I had taken for bacon was listed as grilled yeast strips country style. But in spite of a thirty-year fast, my mind was not on food. They had sent a newspaper in with breakfast, the Great Los Angeles Times, for Wednesday, 13 December, 2000. Newspapers had not changed much, not in format. This one was tabloid size, the paper was glazed instead of rough pulp, and the illustrations were either full color or black and white stereo. I couldn't puzzle out the gimmick on that last. There had been stereo pictures you could look at without a viewer since I was a small child. As a kid, I had been fascinated by ones used to advertise frozen foods in the 50s. But those had required fairly thick transparent plastic for a grid of tiny prisms. These were simply on thin paper. Yet they had depth. I gave it up and looked at the rest of the paper. Eager Beaver had arranged it on a reading rack, and for a while it seemed as if the front page was all I was going to read, for I could not find out how to open the darn thing. The sheets seemed to have frozen solid. Finally, I accidentally touched the lower right-hand corner of the first sheet. It curled up and out of the way, some surface charge phenomenon triggered at that point. The other pages got neatly out of the way in succession whenever I touched that spot. At least half of the paper was so familiar as to make me homesick. Your horoscope today, mayor dedicates new reservoir, security restrictions undermining freedom of press, says N.Y. Solon, giants take double header, unseasonable warmth perils winter sports, Pakistan warns India, etc. ad tedium. This is where I came in. Some of the other items were new but explained themselves. Luna shuttle still suspended for Geminids. 24-hour station suffers two punctures, no casualties. Four whites lynched in Cape Town. UN action demanded. Host mothers organize for higher fees. Demand amateurs be outlawed. Mississippi planter indicted under anti-zombie law. His defense? Them boys ain't drugged, they're just stupid. I was fairly sure that I knew what that last one meant from experience. But some of the news items missed me completely. The Wogleys were still spreading, and three more French towns had been evacuated. The King was considering ordering the area dusted. King? Oh well, French politics might turn up anything. But what was this poudre sanitaire they were considering using on the Wogleys, whatever they were? Radioactive, maybe? I hoped they picked a dead calm day, preferably the 30th of February. I had had a radiation overdose myself once, through a mistake by a damn fool whack technician at Sandia. I had not reached the point of no return vomiting stage, but I don't recommend a diet of curries. The Laguna Beach Division of the Los Angeles Police had been equipped with lay coils, and the division chief warned all teddies to get out of town. My men have orders to narc first and subspec afterward. This has got to stop. I made a mental note to keep clear of Laguna Beach until I found out what the score was. I wasn't sure I wanted to be subspect or subspected, even afterward. Those are just samples. There were any number of news stories that started out trippingly, then foundered in what was, to me, double talk. I started to breeze on past the vital statistics when my eye caught some new subheads. There were the old familiar ones of births, deaths, marriages, and divorces, but now there were commitments, 
and withdrawals as well, listed by sanctuaries. I looked up Sautel Kant's Sank and found my own name. It gave me a warm feeling of belonging. But the most intensely interesting things in the paper were the ads. One of the personals stuck in my mind. Attractive, still young widow with yen to travel wishes to meet mature man similarly inclined. Object, two-year marriage contract. But it was the display advertising that got me. Hired girl and her sisters and her cousins and her aunts were all over the place, and they were still using the trademark, a husky girl with a broom, that I had designed originally for our letterhead. I felt a twinge of regret that I had been in such a jumping hurry to get rid of my stock in Hired Girl, Inc. It looked as if it was worth more than all the rest of my portfolio. No, that was wrong. If I had kept it with me at the time, that pair of thieves would have lifted it and faked an assignment to themselves. As it was, Ricky had gotten it. And if it had made Ricky rich, well, it couldn't happen to a nicer person. I made a note to track down Ricky first thing, top priority. She was all that was left to me of the world I had known, and she loomed very large in my mind. Dear little Ricky, if she had been ten years older I would never have looked at Belle, and wouldn't have got my fingers burned. Let's see, how old would she be now? Forty. No, forty-one. It was hard to think of Ricky as forty-one. Still, that wouldn't be old in a woman these days, or even those days. From forty feet you frequently couldn't tell forty-one from eighteen. If she was rich, I'd let her buy me a drink, and we would drink to Pete's dear departed funny little soul. And if something had slipped and she was poor in spite of the stock I had assigned her, then, by damn, I'd marry her. Yes, I would. It didn't matter that she was ten years or so older than I was— in view of my established record for flubbing the dub, I needed somebody older to look out for me and tell me no, and Ricky was just the girl who could do it. She had run Miles and Miles' house with serious little girl efficiency when she was less than ten. At forty she would be just the same, only mellowed. I felt really warm and no longer lost in a strange land for the first time since I had wakened. Ricky was the answer to everything. Then, deep inside me, I heard a voice. Look, stupid, you can't marry Ricky, because a girl as sweet as she was going to be would now have been married for at least twenty years. She'll have four kids, maybe a son bigger than you are, and certainly a husband who won't be amused by you in the role of good old Uncle Danny. I listened, and my jaw sagged. Then I said feebly, all right, all right, so I've missed the boat again. But I'm still going to look her up. They can't do more than shoot me. And after all, she's the only other person who really understood Pete. I turned another page, suddenly very glum at the thought of having lost both Ricky and Pete. After a while I fell asleep over the paper and slept until Eager Beaver or his twin fetched lunch. While I was asleep, I dreamed that Ricky was holding me on her lap, saying, It's all right, Danny. I found Pete, and now we're both here to stay. Isn't that so, Pete? Meow. The added vocabularies were a cinch. I spent much more time on the historical summaries. Quite a lot can happen in thirty years, but why put it down when everybody else knows it better than I do? I wasn't surprised that the great Asia Republic was crowding us out of the South American trade. That had been in the cards since the Formosan Treaty. Nor was I surprised to find India more balkanized than ever. The notion of England being a province of Canada stopped me for a moment. Which was the tail and which was the dog? I skipped over the panic of 87. Gold was a wonderful engineering material for some uses— I could not regard it as a tragedy to find that it was now cheap and no longer a basis for money, no matter how many people lost their shirts in the changeover. I stopped reading and thought about the things you could do with cheap gold, with its high density, good conductivity, extreme ductility, and stopped when I realized I would have to read the technical literature first. Shocks in atomics alone it would be invaluable. The way the stuff could be worked, far better than any other metal, if you could use it in miniaturizing, 
Again I stopped, morally certain that eager beaver had had his head crammed full of gold. I would just have to get busy and find out what the boys had been doing in the small back rooms while I had been away. The Sawtell Sanctuary wasn't equipped to let me read up on engineering, so I told Doc Albrecht I was ready to check out. He shrugged, told me I was an idiot, and agreed. But I did stay one more night. I found that I was fagged just from lying back and watching words chase past in a book scanner. They brought me modern clothes right after breakfast the next morning, and I had to have help in dressing. They were not so odd in themselves, although I had never worn cerise trousers with bell-bottoms before, but I could not manage the fastenings without coaching. I suppose my grandfather might have had the same trouble with zippers if he had not been led into them gradually. It was the stick-tight closure seams, of course. I thought I was going to have to hire a little boy to help me go to the bathroom before I got it through my head that the pressure-sensitive adhesion was actually polarized. Then I almost lost my pants when I tried to ease the waistband. No one laughed at me. Dr. Albrecht asked, What are you going to do? Me? First I'm going to get a map of the city. Then I'm going to find a place to sleep. Then I'm going to do nothing but professional reading for quite a while, maybe a year. Doc, I'm an obsolete engineer. I don't aim to stay that way. Hmm, well, good luck. Don't hesitate to call if I can help. I stuck out my hand. Thanks, Doc. You've been swell. Uh, maybe I shouldn't mention this until I talk to the accounting office of my insurance company and see just how well off I am. But I don't intend to let it go with words. Thanks for the sort of thing you've done for me should be more substantial. Understand me? He shook his head. I appreciate the thought, but my fees are covered by my contract with the sanctuary. But, no, I can't take it, so please let's not discuss it. He shook hands and said, Goodbye. If you stay on this slide, it will take you to the main offices. He hesitated. If you find things a bit tiring at first, you're entitled to four more days' recuperation and reorientation here without additional charge under the custodial contract. It's paid for. Might as well use it. You can come and go as you like. I grinned. Thanks, Doc. But you can bet I won't be back, other than to say hello some day. I stepped off at the main office and told the receptionist there who I was. It handed me an envelope, which I saw was another phone message from Mrs. Schultz. I still had not called her because I did not know who she was, and the sanctuary did not permit visits or phone calls to a revivified client until he wanted to accept them. I simply glanced at it and tucked it in my blouse, while thinking that I might have made a mistake in making flexible Frank too flexible. Receptionists used to be pretty girls, not machines. The receptionist said, Step this way, please. Our treasurer would like to see you. Well, I wanted to see him, too, so I stepped that way. I was wondering how much money I had made and was congratulating myself on having plunged in common stocks rather than playing it safe. No doubt my stocks had dropped in the panic of 87, but they ought to be back up now. In fact, I knew that at least two of them were worth a lot of dough now. I had been reading the financial section of the Times. I still had the paper with me, figuring I might want to look up some others. The treasurer was a human being, even though he looked like a treasurer. He gave me a quick handshake. How do you do, Mr. Davis? I'm Mr. Dowdy. Sit down, please. I said, Howdy, Mr. Dowdy. I probably don't need to take that much of your time. Just tell me this. Does my insurance company handle its settlements through your office, or should I go to their home offices? Do, please, sit down. I have several things to explain to you. So I sat. His office assistant, good old Frank again, fetched a file folder for him, and he said, These are your original contracts. Would you like to see them? I wanted very much to see them, as I had kept my fingers crossed ever since I was fully awake, wondering if Bell had figured out some way to bite the end off that certified check. A certified check is much harder to play hanky-panky with than is a personal check, but Bell was a clever gal. I was much relieved to see that she had left my commitments unchanged, 
except, of course, that the side contract for Pete was missing, and also the one concerning my hired girl stock. I supposed that she had just burned those to keep from raising questions. I examined with care the dozen or more places where she had changed Mutual Assurance Company to Master Insurance Company of California. The gal was a real artist, no question. I suppose a scientific criminologist armed with microscope and comparison stereo and chemical tests and so forth could have proved that each of those documents had been altered, but I could not. I wondered how she had coped with the closed endorsement on the back of the certified check, since certified checks are always on paper guaranteed non-erasable. Well, she probably had not used an eraser. What one person can dream up, another person can outsmart, and Bell was very smart. Mr. Dowdy cleared his throat. I looked up. Do we settle my account here? Yes. Then I can put it in two words. How much? Mm, Mr. Davis, before we go into that question, I would like to invite your attention to one additional document, and to one circumstance. This is the contract between this sanctuary and Master Insurance Company of California for your hypothermia, custody, and revivification. You will note that the entire fee is paid in advance. This is both for our protection and for yours, since it guarantees your safe being while you are helpless. The funds, all such funds, are placed in escrow with the Superior Court Division handling chancery matters and are paid quarterly to us as earned. Okay, sounds like a good arrangement. It is. It protects the helpless. Now you must understand clearly that this sanctuary is a separate corporation from your insurance company. The custodial contract with us was a contract entirely separate from the one for the management of your estate. Mr. Dowdy, what are you getting at? Do you have any assets other than those you entrusted to Master Insurance Company? I thought it over. I had owned a car once, but God alone knew what had become of it. I had closed out my checking account in Mojave early in the binge, and on that busy day when I ended up at Miles's place and in the soup, I had started with maybe thirty or forty dollars in cash. Books, clothes, slide rule. I had never been a pack rat, and that minor junk was gone anyhow. Not even a bus transfer, Mr. Dowdy. Then, I am very sorry to have to tell you this, you have no assets of any sort. I held still while my head circled the field and came in for a crash landing. What do you mean? Why, some of the stocks I invested in are in fine shape. I know they are. It says so right here. I held up my breakfast copy of the Times. He shook his head. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, but you don't own any stocks. Master Insurance went broke. I was glad he had made me sit down. I felt weak. How did this happen? The panic? No, no, it was part of the collapse of the Mannix Group. But of course you don't know about that. It happened after the panic, and I suppose you could say that it started from the panic. But Master Insurance would not have gone under if it had not been systematically looted, gutted, milked is the vulgar word. If it had been an ordinary receivership, something at least would have been salvaged, but it was not. By the time it was discovered, there was nothing left of the company but a hollow shell, and the men who had done it were beyond extradition. Ah, uh, if it is any consolation to you, it could not happen under our present laws. No, it was no consolation, and besides, I didn't believe it. My old man claimed that the more complicated the law, the more opportunity for scoundrels. But he also used to say that a wise man should be prepared to abandon his baggage at any time. I wondered how often I was going to have to do it to qualify as wise. Uh, Mr. Dowdy, just out of curiosity, how did Mutual Assurance make out? Mutual Assurance Company? A fine firm. Oh, they took their licking during the panic along with everybody else, but they weathered it. You have a policy with them, perhaps? No. I did not offer explanation. There was no use. I couldn't look to mutual. I had never executed my contract with them. I couldn't sue master insurance. There is no point in suing a bankrupt corpse. 
I could sue Bell and Miles if they were still around, but why be silly? No proof. None. Besides, I did not want to sue Bell. It would be better to tattoo her all over with null and void, using a dull needle. Then I'd take up the matter of what she had done to Pete. I hadn't figured out a punishment to suit the crime for that one yet. I suddenly remembered that it was the Mannix group that Miles and Bell had been about to sell Hired Girl Inc. to when they had booted me out. Mr. Dowdy, are you sure that the Mannix people haven't any assets? Don't they own Hired Girl? Hired Girl? Do you mean the domestic auto appliance firm? Yes, of course. It hardly seems possible. In fact, it is not possible, since the Mannix Empire as such no longer exists. Of course, I can't say that there never was any connection between Hired Girl Corporation and the Mannix people, but I don't believe it could have been much, if any, or I think I would have heard of it. I dropped the matter. If Miles and Bell had been caught in the collapse of Mannix, that suited me fine. But on the other hand, if Mannix had owned and milked Hired Girl Inc., it would have hit Ricky as hard as it hit them. I didn't want Ricky hurt, no matter what the side issues were. I stood up. Well, thanks for breaking it gently, Mr. Dowdy. I'll be on my way. Don't go yet. Mr. Davis... We of this institution feel a responsibility toward our people beyond the mere letter of the contract. You understand that yours is by no means the first case of this sort. Now our board of directors has placed a small discretionary fund at my disposal to ease such hardships. It... No charity, Mr. Dowdy. Thanks anyhow. Not charity, Mr. Davis. A loan. A character loan, you might call it. Believe me, our losses have been negligible on such loans, and we don't want you to walk out of here with your pockets empty. I thought that went over twice. I didn't even have the price of a haircut. On the other hand, borrowing money is like trying to swim with a brick in each hand, and a small loan is tougher to pay back than a million. Mr. Dowdy, I said slowly, Dr. Albrecht said that I was entitled to four more days of beans and bed here. I believe that is right. I'd have to consult your card. Not that we throw people out even when their contract time is up if they are not ready. I didn't suppose that you did. But what are the rates on that room I had, as hospital room and board? Eh? But our rooms are not for rent in that way. We aren't a hospital. We simply maintain a recovery infirmary for our clients. Yes, surely. But you must figure it at least for cost accounting purposes. Hmm, yes and no. The figures aren't allocated on that basis. The subheads are depreciation, overhead, operation, reserves, diet kitchen, personnel, and so forth. I suppose I could make an estimate. Ah, uh, don't bother. What would equivalent room and board in a hospital come to? That's a little out of my line. Still, well, you could call it about $100 per day, I suppose. I had four days coming. Will you lend me four hundred dollars? He did not answer, but spoke in a number code to his mechanical assistant. Then eight fifty-dollar bills were being counted into my hand. Thanks, I said sincerely as I tucked it away. I'll do my damnedest to see that this does not stay on the books too long. Six percent? Or is money tight? He shook his head. It's not a loan. Since you put it as you did, I cancelled it against your unused time. Huh? Now see here, Mr. Dowdy, I didn't intend to twist your arm. Of course I'm going to... Please, I told my assistant to enter the charge when I directed it to pay you. Do you want to give our auditors headaches all for a fiddling four hundred dollars? I was prepared to loan you much more than that. Well, I can't argue it now. Say, Mr. Dowdy, how much money is this? How are price levels now? Hmm, that is a complex question. Just give me an idea. What does it cost to eat? Food is quite reasonable. For ten dollars you can get a very satisfactory dinner, if you are careful to select moderate-priced restaurants. I thanked him and left with a really warm feeling. Mr. Dowdy reminded me of a paymaster I used to have in the Army. Paymasters come in only two sizes— one sort shows you where the book says that you can't have what you've got coming to you. 
The second sort digs through the book until he finds a paragraph that lets you have what you need even if you don't rate it. Doughty was the second sort. The sanctuary faced on the Wilshire Ways. There were benches in front of it and bushes and flowers. I sat down on a bench to take stock and to decide whether to go east or west. I had kept a stiff lip with Mr. Doughty, but, honestly, I was badly shaken, even though I had the price of a week's meals in my jeans. But the sun was warm and the drone of the ways was pleasant, and I was young, biologically at least, and I had two hands and my brain. Whistling, Hallelujah, I'm a bum, I opened the times to the help-wanted columns. I resisted the impulse to look through professional engineers and turned at once to unskilled. That classification was darned short. I almost couldn't find it. 6. I got a job the second day, Friday the 15th of December. I also had a mild run-in with the law and had repeated tangles with new ways of doing things, saying things, feeling about things. I discovered that reorientation by reading about it is like reading about sex, not the same thing. I suppose I would have had less trouble if I had been set down in Omsk or Santiago or Jakarta. In going to a strange city in a strange land, you know that the customs are going to be different. But in great Los Angeles, I subconsciously expected things to be unchanged, even though I could see that they were changed. Of course, thirty years is nothing. Anybody takes that much change and more in a lifetime. But it makes a difference to take it in one bite. Take one word I used all in innocence. A lady present was offended, and only the fact that I was a sleeper, which I hastily explained, kept her husband from giving me a mouthful of knuckles. I won't use the word here. Oh, yes, I will. Why shouldn't I? I'm using it to explain something. Don't take my word for it that the word was in good usage when I was a kid. Look it up in an old dictionary. Nobody scrawled it in chalk on sidewalks when I was a kid. The word was kink. There were other words which I still do not use properly without stopping to think. Not taboo words, necessarily, just ones with changed meanings. Host, for example. Host used to mean the man who took your coat and put it in the bedroom. It had nothing to do with the birth rate. But I got along. The job I found was crushing new ground limousines so that they could be shipped back to Pittsburgh as scrap. Cadillacs, Chryslers, Eisenhowers, Lincolns, all sorts of great, big, new, powerful turbo buggies without a kilometer on their clocks. Drive them between the jaws, then crunch, smack, crash. Scrap iron for the blast furnaces. It hurt me at first since I was riding the ways to work and didn't own so much as a grav jumper. I expressed my opinion of it and almost lost my job, until the shift boss remembered that I was a sleeper and really didn't understand. It's a simple matter of economics, son. These are surplus cars the government has accepted as security against price support loans. They're two years old now and they can never be sold. So the government junks them and sells them back to the steel industry. You can't run a blast furnace just on ore. You have to have scrap iron as well. You ought to know that even if you are a sleeper. Matter of fact, with high-grade ore so scarce, there's more and more demand for scrap. The steel industry needs these cars. But why build them in the first place if they can't be sold? It seems wasteful. It just seems wasteful. You want to throw people out of work? You want to run down the standard of living? Well, why not ship them abroad? It seems to me they could get more for them on the open market abroad than they are worth as scrap. What? And ruin the export market? Besides, if we started dumping cars abroad, we'd get everybody sore at us. Japan, France, Germany, Great Asia, everybody. What are you aiming to do, start a war? He sighed and went on in a fatherly tone. You go down to the public library and draw out some books. You don't have any right to opinions on these things until you know something about them. So I shut up. I didn't tell him that I was spending all my off time at the public library or at UCLA's library. I had avoided admitting that I was, or used to be, an engineer. To claim that I was now an engineer would be too much like walking up to DuPont's and saying, Sira, I am an alchemist. 
hast need of art such as mine? I raised the subject just once more, because I noticed that very few of the price support cars were really ready to run. The workmanship was sloppy, and they often lacked essentials like instrument dials or air conditioners. But when one day I noticed from the way the teeth of the crusher came down on one that it lacked even a power plant, I spoke up about it. The shift boss just stared at me. Great jumping Jupiter, son! Surely you don't expect them to put their best workmanship into cars that are just surplus. These cars had price support loans against them before they ever came off the assembly line. So that time I shut up and stayed shut. I had better stick to engineering. Economics is too esoteric for me. But I had plenty of time to think. The job I had was not really a job at all in my book. All the work was done by flexible Frank in his various disguises. Frank and his brothers ran the crusher, moved the cars into place, hauled away the scrap, kept count, and weighed the loads. My job was to stand on a little platform. I wasn't allowed to sit, and hang on to a switch that could stop the whole operation if something went wrong. Nothing ever did, but I soon found that I was expected to spot at least one failure in automation each shift, stop the job, and send for a trouble crew. Well, it paid twenty-one dollars a day, and it kept me eating. First things first. After Social Security, Guild dues, income tax, defense tax, medical plan, and the welfare mutual fund, I took home about sixteen of it. Mister Dowdy was wrong about dinner costing ten dollars. You could get a very decent plate dinner for three if you did not insist on real meat. And I would defy anyone to tell whether a hamburger steak started life in a tank or out on the open range. With the stories going around about bootleg meat that might give you radiation poisoning, I was perfectly happy with surrogates. Where to live had been somewhat of a problem, since Los Angeles had not been treated to the one-second slum clearance plan in the Six Weeks' War. An amazing number of refugees had gone there. I suppose I was one of them, although I hadn't thought of myself as such at the time. And apparently, none of them had ever gone home, even those that had homes left to go back to. The city, if you can call Great Los Angeles a city, it is more of a condition, had been choked when I went to sleep. Now it was as jammed as a lady's purse. It may have been a mistake to get rid of the smog. Back in the sixties, a few people used to leave each year because of sinusitis. Now apparently nobody left, ever. The day I checked out of the sanctuary, I had had several things on my mind. Principally, one, find a job; two, find a place to sleep. Three, catch up in engineering; four, find Ricky; five, get back into engineering on my own, if humanly possible; six, find Bell and Miles and settle their hash without going to jail for it; and seven, a slug of things like looking up the original patent on Eager Beaver and checking my strong hunch that it was really flexible Frank. Not that it mattered now, just curiosity. And looking up the corporate history of Hired Girl Inc., etc., etc. I have listed the above in order of priority, as I had found out years ago, through almost flunking my freshman year in engineering, that if you didn't use priorities when the music stopped, you were left standing. Some of these priorities ran concurrently, of course. I expected to search out Ricky and probably Bell and Company as well while I was boning engineering. But first things first, and second things second. Finding a job came even ahead of hunting for a sack, because dollars are the key to everything else, when you haven't got them. After getting turned down six times in town, I had chased an ad clear out to San Bernardino Borough, only to get there ten minutes too late. I should have rented a flop at once. Instead, I played it real smart and went back downtown, intending to find a room, then get up very early and be first in line for some job listed in the early edition. How was I to know? I got my name on four rooming house waiting lists and wound up in the park. I stayed there walking to keep warm until almost midnight, then gave up. Great Los Angeles winters are subtropical only if you accent the sub. I then took refuge in a station of Wilshire Ways, and about two in the morning they rounded me up with the rest of the vagrants. Jails have improved. This one was warm, and I think they required the cockroaches to wipe their feet. I was charged with barracking. 
The judge was a young fellow who didn't even look up from his newspaper, but simply said, These all first offenders? Yes, Your Honor. Thirty days or take a labor company parole. Next. They started to march us out, but I didn't budge. Just a minute, Judge. Huh? Something troubling you? Are you guilty or not guilty? Uh, I really don't know because I don't know what it is I have done. You see, do you want a public defender? If you do, you can be locked up until one can handle your case. I understand they are running about six days late right now, but it's your privilege. Uh, I still don't know. Maybe what I want is a labor company parole, though I'm not sure what it is. What I really want is some advice from the court, if the court pleases. The judge said to the bailiff, Take the others out. He turned back to me. Spill it, but I'll warrant you won't like my advice. I've been on this job long enough to have heard every phony story and to have acquired a deep disgust toward most of them. Yes, sir. Mine isn't phony. It's easily checked. You see, I just got out of the long sleep yesterday and... But he did look disgusted. One of those, huh? I've often wondered what made our grandparents think they could dump their riffraff on us. The last thing on earth this city needs is more people, especially ones who couldn't get along in their own time. I wish I could boot you back to whatever year you came from with a message to everybody there that the future they're dreaming about is not, repeat, not paved with gold. He sighed. But it wouldn't do any good, I'm sure. Well, what do you expect me to do? Give you another chance, then have you pop up here again a week from now? Judge, I don't think I'm likely to. I've got enough money to live until I find a job and... Huh? If you've got money, what were you doing barracking? Judge, I don't even know what that word means. This time he let me explain. When I came to how I had been swindled by Master Insurance Company, his whole manner changed. Those swine! My mother got taken by them after she had paid premiums for twenty years. Why didn't you tell me this in the first place? He took out a card, wrote something on it, and said, Take this to the hiring office at the Surplus and Salvage Authority. If you don't get a job, come back and see me this afternoon. But no more barracking. Not only does it breed crime and vice, but you yourself are running a terrible risk of meeting up with a zombie recruiter. That's how I got a job smashing up brand new ground cars. But I still think I made no mistake in logic in deciding to job hunt first. Anywhere is home to the man with a fat bank account. The cops leave him alone. I found a decent room, too, within my budget, in a part of West Los Angeles which had not yet been changed over to new plan. I think it had formerly been a coat closet. I would not want anyone to think I disliked the year 2000 as compared with 1970. I liked it, and I liked 2001 when it rolled around a couple of weeks after they wakened me. In spite of recurrent spasms of almost unbearable homesickness, I thought that great Los Angeles at the dawn of the third millennium was odds-on the most wonderful place I had ever seen. It was fast and clean and very exciting, even if it was too crowded, and even that was being coped with on a mammoth, venturesome scale. The new plan parts of town were a joy to an engineer's heart. If the city government had had the sovereign power to stop immigration for ten years, they could have licked the housing problem. Since they did not have that power, they just had to do their best with the swarms that kept rolling over the Sierras, and their best was spectacular beyond belief, and even the failures were colossal. It was worth sleeping thirty years just to wake up in a time when they had licked the common cold and nobody had a post-nasal drip. That meant more to me than the research colony on Venus. Two things impressed me most, one big, one little. The big one was null grav, of course. Back in 1970 I had known about the Babson Institute gravitation research, but I had not expected anything to come of it, and nothing had. The basic field theory on which null grav is based was developed at the University of Edinburgh. But I had been taught in school that gravitation was something that nobody could ever do anything about, because it was inherent in the very shape of space. So they changed the shape of space, naturally. Only temporarily and locally, to be sure, but that's all that's needed in moving a heavy object. It still has to stay in field relation with Mother Terra, so it's useless for spaceships, or it is in 2001, 
I've quit making bets about the future. I learned that to make a lift, it was still necessary to expend power to overcome the gravity potential, and conversely, to lower something, you had to have a power pack to store all those foot pounds in, or something would go spring. But just to transport something horizontally, say from San Francisco to Great Los Angeles, just lift it once, then float along, no power at all, like an ice skater riding a long edge. Lovely. I tried to study the theory of it, but the math starts in where tensor calculus leaves off. It's not for me. But an engineer is rarely a mathematical physicist, and he does not have to be. He simply has to savvy the skinny of a thing well enough to know what it can do in practical applications, know the working parameters. I could learn those. The little thing I mentioned was the changes in female style made possible by the stick-tight fabrics. I was not startled by mere skin on bathing beaches. You could see that coming in 1970. But the weird things that the ladies could do with stick-tight made my jaw sag. My grandpappy was born in 1890. I suppose that some of the sights in 1970 would have affected him the same way. But I liked the fast new world, and would have been happy in it if I had not been so bitterly lonely so much of the time. I was out of joint. There were times, in the middle of the night usually, when I would gladly have swapped it all for one beat-up tomcat, or for a chance to spend an afternoon taking little Ricky to the zoo or for the comradeship Miles and I had shared when all we had was hard work and hope. It was still early in 2001, and I wasn't halfway caught up on my homework, when I began to itch to leave my feather-bedded job and get back to the old drawing board. There were so many, many things possible under current art which had been impossible in 1970. I wanted to get busy and design a few dozen. For example, I had expected that there would be automatic secretaries in use. I mean a machine you could dictate to and get back a business letter, spelling, punctuation, and format all perfect, without a human being in the sequence. But there weren't any. Oh, somebody had invented a machine which could type, but it was suited only to a phonetic language like Esperanto, and was useless in a language in which you could say, though the tough cough and hiccup plow him through. People won't give up the illogicalities of English to suit the convenience of an inventor. Mohammed must go to the mountain. If a high school girl could sort out the cockeyed spelling of English and usually type the right word, how could a machine be taught to do it? Impossible was the usual answer. It was supposed to require human judgment and understanding. But an invention is something that was impossible up to then. That's why governments grant patents. With memory tubes and the miniaturization now possible, I had been right about the importance of gold as an engineering material, with those two things it would be easy to pack a hundred thousand sound codes into a cubic foot. In other words, to sound key every word in a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. But that was unnecessary. Ten thousand would be ample. Who expects a stenographer to field a word like kerbosh or pyrophyllite? You spell such words for her if you must use them. Okay, we code the machine to accept spelling when necessary. We sound code for punctuation and for various formats, and to look up addresses in a file, and for how many copies, and routing, and provide at least a thousand blank word codings for special vocabulary used in a business or profession and make it so that the owner-client could put those special words in himself. Spell a word like stenobenthic with the memory key depressed and never have to spell it again. All simple. Just a matter of hooking together gadgets already on the market, then smoothing it into a production model. The real hitch was homonyms. Dictation Daisy wouldn't even slow up over that tough, cough, and hiccup sentence because each of those words carries a different sound. But choices like there, T-H-E-Y, apostrophe, R-E, and there, T-H-E-I-R, right, R-I-G-H-T, and right, W-R-I-T-E, would give her trouble. Did the L.A. Public Library have a dictionary of English homonyms? 
It did, and I began counting the unavoidable hominin pairs and trying to figure out how many of these could be handled by information theory through context statistics and how many would require special coding. I began to get jittery with frustration. Not only was I wasting 30 hours a week on an utterly useless job, but also I could not do real engineering in a public library. I needed a drafting room, a shop where I could smooth out the bugs, trade catalogs, professional journals, calculating machines, and all the rest. I decided that I would just have to get at least a sub-professional job. I wasn't silly enough to think that I was an engineer again. There was too much art I had not yet soaked up. Repeatedly I had thought of ways to do something using something new that I had learned, only to find out at the library that somebody had solved the same problem, neater, better, and cheaper than my own first stab at it, and ten or fifteen years earlier. I needed to get into an engineering office and let these new things soak in through my skin. I had hopes that I could land a job as a junior draftsman. I knew that they were using powered semi-automatic drafting machines now. I had seen pictures of them even though I had not had one under my hands. But I had a hunch that I could learn to play one in twenty minutes given the chance, for they were remarkably like an idea I had once had myself. A machine that bore the same relation to the old-fashioned drawing board and T-square method that a typewriter did to writing in longhand. I had worked it all out in my head how you could put straight lines or curves anywhere on an easel just by punching keys. However, in this case I was just as sure that my idea had not been stolen as I was certain that Flexible Frank had been stolen, because my drafting machine had never existed except in my head. Somebody had had the same idea and had developed it logically the same way. When it's time to railroad, people start railroading. The Aladdin people, the same firm that made Eager Beaver, made one of the best drawing machines, Drafting Dan. I dipped into my savings, bought a better suit of clothes and a second-hand briefcase, stuffed the latter with newspapers, and presented myself at the Aladdin sales rooms with a view to buying one. I asked for a demonstration. Then, when I got close to a model of drafting Dan, I had the most upsetting experience. Deja vu, the psychologists call it. I have been here before. The damned thing had been developed in precisely the fashion in which I would have developed it, had I had time to do so, instead of being kidnapped into the long sleep. Don't ask me exactly why I felt that way. A man knows his own style of work. An art critic will say that a painting is a Rubens or a Rembrandt by the brushwork, the treatment of light, the composition, the choice of pigment, a dozen things. Engineering is not science, it is an art, and there is always a wide range of choices in how to solve engineering problems. An engineering designer signs his work by those choices just as surely as a painter does. Drafting Dan had the flavor of my own technique so strongly that I was quite disturbed by it. I began to wonder if there wasn't something to telepathy after all. I was careful to get the number of its first patent. In the state I was in, I wasn't surprised to see that the date on the first one was 1970. I resolved to find out who had invented it. It might have been one of my own teachers, from whom I had picked up some of my style. Or it might be an engineer with whom I had once worked. The inventor might still be alive, if so, I'd look him up some day, get acquainted with this man whose mind worked just like mine. But I managed to pull myself together and let the salesman show me how to work it. He hardly need have bothered. Drafting Dan and I were made for each other. In ten minutes I could play it better than he could. At last I reluctantly quit making pretty pictures with it, got list price, discounts, service arrangements and so forth, then left saying that I would call him just as he was ready to get my signature on the dotted line. It was a dirty trick, but all I cost him was an hour's time. From there I went to the hired girl main factory and applied for a job. I knew that Bell and Miles were no longer with Hired Girl Inc. In what time I could spare between my job and the compelling necessity to catch up in engineering, I had been searching for Bell and Miles, and most especially for Ricky. None of the three was listed in the great Los Angeles telephone system, nor, for that matter, anywhere in the United States.
or I had paid to have an information search made at the national office in Cleveland. A quadruple fee it was, as I had had Bell searched for under both Gentry and Darkin. I had the same luck with the Register of Voters for Los Angeles County. Hired Girl Inc., in a letter from a 17th vice president in charge of foolish questions, admitted cautiously that they had once had officers by those names thirty years ago, but they were unable to help me now. Picking up a trail thirty years cold is no job for an amateur with little time and less money. I did not have their fingerprints, or I might have tried the FBI. I didn't know their social security numbers. My country, tis of thee, had never succumbed to police state nonsense, so there was no bureau certain to have a dossier on each citizen, nor was I in a position to tap such a file even if there had been. Perhaps a detective agency, lavishly subsidized, could have dug through utilities records, newspaper files, and God knows what, and traced them down. But I didn't have the lavish subsidy, nor the talent and time to do it myself. I finally gave up on Miles and Bell while promising myself that I would, as quickly as I could afford it, put professionals to tracing Ricky. I had already determined that she held no hired girl stock, and I had written to the Bank of America to see if they held, or ever had held, a trust for her. I got back a form letter informing me that such things were confidential, so I had written again saying that I was a sleeper and she was my only surviving relative. That time I got a nice letter signed by one of the trust officers and saying that he regretted that information concerning trust beneficiaries could not be divulged even to one in my exceptional circumstances, but he felt justified in giving me the negative information that the bank had not at any time through any of its branches held a trust in favor of one Frederica Virginia Gentry. That seemed to settle one thing. Somehow those birds had managed to get the stock away from little Ricky. My assignment of the stock would have had to go through the Bank of America the way I had written it, but it had not. Poor Ricky. We had both been robbed. I made one more stab at it. The records office of the superintendent of instruction in Mojave did have record of a grade school pupil named Frederica Virginia Gentry but the named pupil had taken a withdrawal transcript in 1971. Further deponent saith not. It was some consolation to know that somebody somewhere admitted that Ricky had ever existed, but she might have taken that transcript to any of many, many thousand public schools in the United States. How long would it take to write to each of them? And were their records so arranged as to permit them to answer, even supposing they were willing? In a quarter of a billion people, one little girl can drop out of sight like a pebble in the ocean. But the failure of my search did leave me free to seek a job with Hired Girl, Inc., now that I knew Miles and Bell were not running it. I could have tried any of a hundred automation firms, but Hired Girl and Aladdin were the big names in appliance automatons, as important in their own field as Ford and General Motors had been in the heyday of the ground automobile. I picked Hired Girl partly for sentimental reasons. I wanted to see what my old outfit had grown into. On Monday, 5 March 2001, I went to their employment office, got into the line for white-collar help, filled out a dozen forms having nothing to do with engineering and one that did, and was told, don't call us, we'll call you. I hung around and managed to bull myself in to see an assistant hiring flunky. He reluctantly looked over the one form that meant anything and told me that my engineering degree meant nothing since there had been a thirty-year lapse when I had not used my skill. I pointed out that I had been a sleeper. That makes it even worse. In any case, we don't hire people over forty-five. But I'm not forty-five. I'm only thirty. You were born in nineteen forty. Sorry. What am I supposed to do, shoot myself? He shrugged. If I were you, I'd apply for an old age pension. I got out quickly before I gave him some advice. Then I walked three quarters of a mile around to the front entrance and went in. The general manager's name was Curtis. I asked for him. I got past the first two layers simply by insisting that I had business with him. Hired Girl Inc. did not use their own automatons as receptionists. They were real flesh and blood. 
Eventually, I reached a place several stories up and, I judged, about two doors from the boss, and here I encountered a firm pass-gauge type who insisted on knowing my business. I looked around. It was a largish office with about forty real people in it, as well as a lot of machines. She said sharply, Well, state your business and I'll check with Mr. Curtis's appointment secretary. I said loudly, making sure that everybody heard it, I want to know what he's going to do about my wife. Sixty seconds later, I was in his private office. He looked up. Well, what the devil is this nonsense? It took half an hour and some old records to convince him that I did not have a wife and that I actually was the founder of the firm. Then things got chummy over drinks and cigars, and I met the sales manager and the chief engineer and other heads of departments. We thought you were dead, Curtis told me. In fact, the company's official history says that you are. Just a rumor. Some other D.B. Davis. The sales manager, Jack Galloway, said suddenly, What are you going to do now, Mr. Davis? Not much. I've, uh, been in the automobile business, but I'm resigning. Why? Why? Isn't it obvious? He swung around toward the chief engineer, Mr. McBee. Hear that, Mac? All you engineers are alike. You wouldn't know a sales angle if it came up and kissed you. Why? Mr. Davis, because you're sales copy, that's why. Because you're romance. Founder of firm comes back from grave to visit brainchild. Inventor of the first robot servant views fruits of his genius. I said hastily, Now, wait a minute. I'm not an advertising model nor a grabby star. I like my privacy. I didn't come here for that. I came here for a job in engineering. Mr. McBee's eyebrows went up, but he said nothing. We wrangled for a while. Galloway tried to tell me that it was my simple duty to the firm I had founded. Mr. McBee said little, but it was obvious that he did not think I would be any addition to his department. At one point he asked me what I knew about designing solid circuits. I had to admit that my only knowledge of them was from a little reading of non-classified publications. Curtis finally suggested a compromise. See here, Mr. Davis... You obviously occupy a very special position. One might say that you founded not merely this firm, but the whole industry. Nevertheless, as Mr. McBee has hinted, the industry has moved on since the year you took the long sleep. Suppose we put you on the staff with the title of, uh, Research Engineer Emeritus. I hesitated. What would that mean? Whatever you made it mean. However, I tell you frankly that you would be expected to cooperate with Mr. Galloway. We not only make these things, we have to sell them. Ah, uh, would I have a chance to do any engineering? That's up to you. You'd have facilities and you could do what you wished. Shop facilities? Curtis looked at McBee. The chief engineer answered, Certainly, certainly, within reason, of course. He had slipped so far into Glasgow's speech that I could hardly understand him. Galloway said briskly, That's settled. May I be excused, B.J.? Don't go away, Mr. Davis. We're going to get a picture of you with the very first model of hired girl. And he did. I was glad to see her, the very model I had put together with my own pinkies and lots of sweat. I wanted to see if she still worked, but McBee wouldn't let me start her up. I don't think he really believed that I knew how she worked. I had a good time at Hired Girl all through March and April. I had all the professional tools I could want. Technical journals, the indispensable trade catalogs, a practical library, a drafting Dan. Hired Girl did not make a drafting machine themselves, so they used the best on the market, which was Aladdin's. And the shop talk of professionals. Music to my ears. I got acquainted especially with Chuck Freudenberg, Components Assistant Chief Engineer. For my money, Chuck was the only real engineer there. The rest were overeducated slipstick mechanics, including McBee, for the Chief Engineer was, I thought, a clear proof that it took more than a degree and a Scottish accent to make an engineer. After we got better acquainted, Chuck admitted that he felt the same way. 
Mac doesn't really like anything new. He would rather do things the way his grandpa did on the bonny banks of the Clyde. What's he doing in this job? Freudenberg did not know the details, but it seemed that the present firm had been a manufacturing company which had simply rented the patents, my patents, from Hired Girl Inc. Then about twenty years ago there had been one of those tax-saving mergers, with Hired Girl stock swapped for stock in the manufacturing firm, and the new firm taking the name of the one that I had founded. Chuck thought that McBee had been hired at that time. He's got a piece of it, I think. Chuck and I used to sit over beers in the evening and discuss engineering, what the company needed, and the witchness of what. His original interest in me had been that I was a sleeper. Too many people I had found had a queasy interest in sleepers, as if we were freaks, and I avoided letting people know that I was one. But Chuck was fascinated by the time jump itself, and his interest was a healthy one in what the world had been like before he was born, as recalled by a man who literally remembered it as, only yesterday. In return, he was willing to criticize the new gadgets that were always boiling up in my head, and set me straight when I, as I did repeatedly, would rough out something that was old hat in 2001 A.D. Under his friendly guidance, I was becoming a modern engineer, catching up fast. But when I outlined to him one April evening my auto-secretary idea, he said slowly, Dan, have you done work on this on company time? Huh? No, not really. Why? How does your contract read? What? I don't have one. Curtis had put me on the payroll, and Galloway had taken pictures of me and had a ghostwriter asking me silly questions. That was all. Hmm, pal, I wouldn't do anything about this until you are sure where you stand. This is really new, and I think you can make it work. I hadn't worried about that angle. Put it away for a while. You know the shape the company is in. It's making money, and we put out good products. But the only new items we've brought out in five years are ones we've acquired by license. I can't get anything new past Mac, but you can bypass Mac and take this to the big boss. So don't, unless you want to hand it over to the company just for your salary check. I took his advice. I continued to design, but I burned any drawings I thought were good. I didn't need them once I had them in my head. I didn't feel guilty about it. They hadn't hired me as an engineer. They were paying me to be a show-window dummy for Galloway. When my advertising value was sucked dry, they would give me a month's pay and a vote of thanks and let me go. But by then I'd be a real engineer again and able to open my own office. If Chuck wanted to take a flyer, I'd take him with me. Instead of handing my story to the newspapers, Jack Galloway played it slow for the national magazines. He wanted life to do a spread, tying it in with one they had done a third of a century earlier on the first production model of Hired Girl. Life did not rise to the bait, but he did manage to plant it several other places that spring, tying it in with display advertising. I thought of growing a beard. Then I realized that no one recognized me and would not have cared if they had. I got a certain amount of crank mail, including one letter from a man who promised me that I would burn eternally in hell for defying God's plan for my life. I chucked it, while thinking that if God had really opposed what had happened to me, he should never have made cold sleep possible. Otherwise, I wasn't bothered. But I did get a phone call on Thursday, 3 May 2001. Mrs. Schultz is on the line, sir. Will you take the call? Schultz? Damnation, I had promised Doughty the last time I had called him that I would take care of that. But I had put it off because I did not want to. I was almost sure it was one of those screwballs who pursued sleepers and asked them personal questions. But she had called several times, Doughty had told me, since I had checked out in December. In accordance with the policy of the sanctuary, they had refused to give her my address, agreeing merely to pass along messages. Well, I owed it to Doughty to shut her up. Put her on. Is this Danny Davis? My office phone had no screen. She could not see me. Speaking. Your name is Schultz? Oh, Danny, darling, it's so good to hear your voice. I didn't answer right away. 
She went on. Don't you know me? I knew her all right. It was Belle Gentry.